through the timing of controlled burns. And the image uh, that I want to talk about, the Nature Conservancy is doing an excellent job of managing the swamp with controlled burns. Uh, and they've been doing these every two to four years. It appears that fly trap health and size starts to decline even before the four years, and flowering is also down in those plots where it has not been burned. The image on the left is of a heavy grass cover during the 2015 count. A summer or growing season burn was done in July following that June count, and you can see how quickly the grass recovers. That middle image was just two weeks after the burn. The image on the right is an image of that same site just one month post-burn. Most importantly, though, in the following year, there is usually a growth in size of plants and also flowering numbers increase. The heavily grassed area had just 3.4% of the plants flowering in 2015, but in 2016 count, one year later post-burn, we found that there were 38% of the plants that were flowering, so a significant increase in that case. This also shows you something about the flowering and following uh, burn. The one on the left is really an image showing you a four months post burn. And the flower, I mean, the traps are really nice, but there was very little flowering at that time. On the other hand, the picture on the right hand side shows you a year later. And in that particular case, you're seeing a lot of flowering. And also, the wire grass itself is starting to come back. And so it's starting to become dense even after one year's time. The Venus flytrap is rated as a species of concern, which provides no real protection for the plant. It's rated S2, which means that there are 6 to 20 large populations in existence. And because of rapid growth today, but also agricultural and silvicultural practices in the past, there have been losses in element occurrences. And these losses, with prospects of further losses, with development have led to efforts to up the status level from species of concern to either threatened or endangered. There is a petition currently before the Plant Conservation Group asking for the status to be raised to endangered because of loss of populations through absence of fire, also development pressures, and also poaching. Before December 2014, the penalty for poaching was a misdemeanor. So basically, it was a slap on the wrist with a $50 fine. The penalty was raised to a felony in 2014. The hope was that this would lead to a reduction in poaching. Unfortunately, 2016, we found that poaching was as bad as ever. Fortunately, though, the following year in 2017, poaching was way down, though still present. It may be that it took a while for the news of the penalty to be realized and that the felony actually hit the pavement so that everyone knew that a felony which could involve 24 months of jail time you know, would be instituted. There have been numerous headlines about the loss and poaching of traps. These are just a couple of them. And though it is serious and important to curb poaching, in some cases the headlines of extinction and the small numbers of plants have been greatly exaggerated. For instance, one headline was that 970 plants were poached in one event, which was said to be 3% of the total species population. That means that there were 35,000 plants in the wild. And I'll tell you, this is just not correct based on our data. And so one of the things I'd like to show you with this to address this issue of numbers, at least in a small way, we decided in our second year of our study to try to determine the number of plants in a small but representative savanna. We used a technique we developed in 2002 during the 10-year flytrap inventory study that was done that year. The method is to count the total plants and the total flowering plants in several representative plots. We establish the percent flowering in the plots relative to total plants, and then we extrapolate that percent to the whole area. It's feasible to count total flowers, but it's not feasible to count total plants. It takes a little bit of effort. But in this particular case, in this one and a half acre savanna, it was possible to count the flowers. I'll hasten to say this is truly an estimate of numbers of plants, but we believe it's a pretty useful one, as you'd never be able to count the total plants, unless you had an army of people, of course. But we found that in this one and a half acre savanna, that the flower numbers range from 6,000 to 10,000 flowering plants over the four-year period of time. And the differences in numbers is because of different fire frequency. The difference in numbers related to burn time as stated uh, before. 
when you apply the flowering percentage factor to the savanna, this gives a total number of plants within this particular savanna at 20,000, actually averaging up to 30,000. Some of the reports in the literature state us have said that the total number is only 35,000. Might say also that one of the larger savannas in the green swamps is called Big Island, and this is the one most people think of when they come to the green swamp. It's over 30 acres, and based on numbers of plants and flowers in it, we would suggest that there's over 100,000 plants in that one savanna. We do believe, however, that the designation should be raised from species of concern to threaten because of development pressures in the area. Brunswick County is one of the fastest growing counties in the state. It's going to add another 100,000 people in the next 30 years. But we also believe it critical to maintain and properly manage the large preserves like the Green Swamp, Holly Shelker, Camp Lejeune, Fort Bragg, uh, Croatan National Forest, as those things that are small roadside, power line, or private ownership areas where fly traps occur are probably going to be lost in the near future. So in conclusion, let me just say that we must maintain our large refugia areas to ensure viability of dynamic municipia, and we must manage our areas well. And we need to think about raising our threat level to threaten and making sure that we maintain the species. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Thanks, Roger. I, I don't, this is Keith. I don't see any uh, questions at the bottom, but I have a quick one if we have, okay. we have a few few seconds here. Um, does the um, do the stresses on the fly traps uh, go beyond the you know the the need for the fire and, and poaching into things such as um, invasive plant species that cover large areas? Is that a, is that a growing concern? Uh, that is not a concern really in these uh, remote savannas. Most of these are off the roadside, so there's been very little uh, invasive. There are some like dotter and others, but as far as something that would occlude you know, major areas of the flytrap population in those ecotonal zones, uh, no, it's not uh, a concern really, at least not in the green swamp. Well, that's good news. Well, thank you, Roger, for, for a very interesting talk and, and in the interest of time we'll we'll move on to our next presenter. All right, thank you. Our next presenter is Todd Witcher of Discover Life in America out of Gatlinburg, Tennessee. And he's going to give you uh, some information on their all taxo biodiversity inventory. Go ahead, uh, Todd. Hello there. Uh, thanks for having me on today. I, I am Todd Witcher from Discover Life in America. We are doing uh, the All Taxa Biodiversity Inventory in Great Smoky Mountains National Park, and we're moving uh, as well. We're moving beyond that to some other places. So I'm going to talk about that today. So um, just to define a little bit about what we do. We, we are a nonprofit with a partnership with the National Park Service uh, to coordinate um, the All Tax of Biodiversity Inventory, or, or ATBI. We've been working in Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Uh, this will be our 20th year since uh, 1998. We do research. Of course, that leads to discovery. We have a citizen science part of our project, uh, which is the education component. And of course, all, all of our work, we hope, leads to better conservation efforts uh, in the park and beyond. As I mentioned, we were founded in 1998. Uh, the idea of an all taxa biodiversity inventory was really coined by um, a scientist, uh, a pretty famous ecologist, Dan Jansen, who's uh, doing this kind of work in Costa Rica now. Um, and he came to the park and asked if, we, if they wanted to do an ATBI in 98, and they agreed, and also decided that 
they needed help, so a, a nonprofit was formed, and that is Discover Life in America. And, and we were we were funded initially by the Park Service, by Friends of the Smokies, and by the the association who runs the bookstores there in the park. Of course, you all know the park is known for its biodiversity, 30 some odd species of salamanders, lots of lots of streams, a temperate rainforest basically, and uh, we found in 20 years that uh, it, not only is it the salamander capital of the world, it's, it's the capital of the world of a lot of different groups. Uh, we mostly look at arthropods and smaller organisms, uh, but we've run the gamut, and I'll get into that, of, of setting tax in the park. Our mission is, is to discover and understand species through science and education for better conservation, as I mentioned. So what is an ATBI? Uh, a survey, an intensive survey of all biodiversity in a given area. We have a lot of ATBIs that we've helped start since this initial work in the Smokies. Uh, several national parks are, are working on ATBIs. Some private parks and places are working on ATBIs. We'll talk a little bit more about this, but as we move forward, we've, we've just formed a partnership um, with a group in China to start an ATBI there in southern China near the border with Laos. But it's a survey of all biodiversity and integration of science, stewardship, conservation, and education, and it's partnerships with scientists, government agencies, universities, and of course, we host lots of volunteers and educators that participate in the project. We consider our ATBI to have three components. Science is the, is the leading component with education and stewardship following, the, following science. Uh, and we spend a lot of time, of course, doing research in the field with volunteers and with scientists, of course, leading the way. We have four basic questions to answer with an ATBI. What species are in the given space? In this case, Smokies, obviously. What are the, their distributions? What is their relative abundance? In other words, are they common or are they rare? Uh, and then what are their ec ecological relationships with other species? What, what, are, what is their role in the environment? Uh, one of the things after 20 years, and we'll get into our numbers with another slide, uh, but we've I describe it as we've, we, we cast a wide net in the beginning. We basically, our organization gives away many grants to get scientists to the park to study these um, different groups. Uh, we've worked with the park to create a priority list. And uh, in the beginning, we, we basically gave money to people, scientists who wanted to do work in the park that with just about anything that needed more work completed on. Now, after 20 years, there are lots of things that have been completed. Lots of groups have been completed. Uh, so the priority, the priority list is, is down to really two categories, introductory projects, which are uh, groups that have had little to no work completed on them. And that's the list there, Diptera, parasitic wasp, um, mites, crustaceans, nematodes. Uh, all of these are areas, and some of them we have really specific areas within each of these groups that we need work on. So uh, in some cases, it comes down to not having a scientist available to do these groups. Uh, and then the second category um, is completing inventory that's already begun. Um, so those are earthworms and mecopteris and aquatic snails dragonflies, damselflies. There are a few others on this list, but these are groups and scientists we're specifically out looking for to come to the park. We, as I mentioned, have many grants to give to get, get these groups completed or worked on. Uh, to date, uh, and this is going to change soon, this is our 20th year and we're 
having several events to celebrate 20 years. But to date, we have 986 new species to science, and we've added almost uh, 10,000 new species records for the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. We will soon pass, and we have several new species to science that are in the hopper, if you will. Uh, we'll soon pass 1,000 new to science, and we'll soon pass 20,000 records for the park. We basically doubled the amount known, the amount of species known in the park in our 20 years of work. As I mentioned, part of our work includes citizen science. We also have worked with some other groups. We're doing a project with TVA now based on the ATBI and based on bio blitzes, um, but also to get citizen science into some of the TVA's uh, public lands. So we're doing not only citizen science in the Smokies, but in other, in other places as well. Again, the conservation part of our project, we like to um, talk about uh, some tools that are being developed and have been developed and are part of heightened conservation efforts, detection of rare species, which would lead to heightened protection, theoretically. Early detection of new invasives, we've, we've accomplished that several times in the Smokies. Our scientists were the first to discover the hemlock woolly indulger there in the park. Um, compliance issues, modeling distributions, a better understanding of ecosystem functions and species interactions, and then back to the citizen science aspect, uh, increased public support and long-term, hopefully long-term political protection and support. One of the products that I encourage everybody to look at, if you haven't already, is our species mapper we helped the park develop with the University of Tennessee. Um, it basically uh, maps biodiversity in the park. Uh, we are still, this is still being updated. We've, we've collected over seven, almost 700,000 records in, in our 20 years, and those uh, data points are used to create this mapper. Uh, if we have at least 30 points, from a species, then that it can be mapped, uh, not only where it's been seen in the park, but where it's predicted to be. Uh, so I would encourage you can see this mapper on our website or on the park's website. Uh, as we move forward, we're, we will continue to work uh, in Great Smoky Mountains National Park. That's our base, of course, but we have formed a partnership with the E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Foundation to help with their Half Earth Project, which is just getting kicked off the ground last year it started. Uh, and we'll be doing part of that work through what's called the Global Biodiversity Census. We have four pilot projects. Our Smokies Project will be one of those. As I mentioned, we just uh, formed a partnership with XTBG, which is in southern China. Uh, to start an ATB, ATBI there, and we'll be working with um, Gorongosa and then hopefully some work in, in Alabama when that, those, Gorongosa is already going strong, the Alabama project is still being talked about. And uh, I think that will, that probably sums it up. Um, I'll be glad to, if we have time, take a few questions. Well, thanks, Todd. I don't see any questions down in the, in the chat uh, area. Um, we have about, according to my timer, about 10 seconds left, so you hit the nail right on the head in terms of getting this done on time. Thank you. Thank you. Let's, uh, let's move on to our next speaker. We get the slide up there. Uh, we'll next hear from Kara Foley from NC State. Going to talk to us about aquatic plant management. So go ahead, Kara, if you're on there. Hi, everybody. I hope you can hear me. My name is Kara Foley, and I'm a graduate student at North Carolina State University, working under the direction of Dr. Rob Richardson. Our group studies aquatic invasive species ecology and management, and we're involved in quite a few of the freshwater aquatic plant management projects that are being done in the water bodies around North Carolina. 
Today I'm going to share some of our findings from our recent, recent partnership with the United States Army Corps of Engineers and their Wilmington District Lakes, which are located in North Carolina and Virginia. The purpose of our project is to take care of the public waters of the Wilmington District Lakes and to ensure that they have sustainable ecosystems. One of the Army Corps' goals is to conserve, protect, and restore their lands, and to meet that goal, they've identified invasive species management as a continuous challenge. With our work, we're creating baseline data that can be used in the future as we continue to monitor these water bodies for potential aquatic invasive species impacts and ultimately create management plans that can be implemented for future efforts. The Wilmington District Lakes that we've been studying include Philpot Lake in Martinsville, Virginia, W. Carr Scott Reservoir in Wilkesboro, North Carolina, Jordan Lake in Chatham County, North Carolina, and Falls Lake in Wake in Ch Chatham County, North Carolina. You'll notice that all four of these lakes are situated within the Piedmont ecoregion of the United States. This ecoregion is characterized by its flat transitional geography as it's positioned between the Blue Ridge Mountains to the west and the upper coastal plain to the east. Soils in this region are generally clay-like and fertile. The lakes in this region are mainly man-made and geologically young. While we did work on all four of these lakes this last summer, I'm only going to talk about Philpot Lake today because I think it's the most interesting and I'd like to share our findings with you all. If you would like to know more about the work that we have been doing at any of the other lakes in the Army Corps of Engineers Wilmington District, please don't hesitate to reach out to me or my advisor, Rob Richardson, via email, and we'd love to share more information with them or about them with you. So Philpot Lake is the northernmost lake in our group of study sites. It's also the smallest and the oldest. The reservoir was formed in 1951 after the Philpot Dam was constructed along the Smith River. For those of you who aren't aware, the Smith River is a part of the Roanoke River Basin, which flows through John H. Carr Reservoir, Lake Gaston, and eventually the Albemarle Sound. The Philpot Dam aids in, in flood control along the Smith River and is also used for hydroelectric power generation. This lake is very popular for recreational opportunities such as boating, swimming, and fishing. Aquatic plant management of this lake is quite important for maintaining a balanced ecosystem that can withstand the pressure of the ecosystem services that Philpot Lake provides. This past summer, we conducted a point intercept survey for submerged aquatic vegetation around the littoral zone at Philpot Lake, and we found four different species of aquatic macrophytes. I hope you can see our results on the map in this slide. It might be a little difficult to see the colors, but um, you can see there are 294 sampling points. We found hydrilla at 79 points, or 27% of the total. Brazilian elodea was found at 16 points, or 5% of the total. Cara, which is a macroalgae, was found at three survey points, which is only about 1% of the total and Southern Naiad was only identified at one point, less than 1% of the total point surveys. So it's clear from these survey results that hydrilla is the most dominant species in Philpot Lake, followed by Brazilian elodea. Both of these plants are non-native invasive species. So um, some of you may be familiar with hydrilla, some of you may not be, but I'll go ahead and talk a little bit more about it. It's very impressive aquatic plant. Its native range is within South Asia, and it likely came to the U.S. through the aquarium trade. It was first found in North Carolina in 1980, and it's now all over our state. Like many other invasive species, it has a very rapid growth rate and is problematic due to the thick monoculture that can form, which blocks water flow, clogs intake pipes, reduces biodiversity, limits recreation, you name it. It also produces underground vegetative propagules called tubers that can be dormant for up to seven years, which makes management extremely difficult. There are two biotypes of hydrilla found in the U.S., monoecious and dioecious. Generally, the monoecious biotype has been documented in the northern states, and the dioecious biotype has been documented in the southern states in the United States. And it's not been documented north of North Carolina on the East Coast. But interestingly, 
Um, the biotype of hydrilla that we identified in Philpot Lake has been positively matched to the dioecious biotype, which means that this population is very uncharacteristic because it's um, the most northern location on the east coast that has been found so far. From our conversations with the Army Corps of Engineers at Philpot Lake, we understand that this population of hydrilla has been persisting in the lake for at least 15 years now. After completing a sonar-based biovolume survey of the lake last year, we estimate that this population is invading at least 37 acres of the lake. So you can see in this, these pictures on my slide here that the hydrilla is very dense. Um, it's been happy in Philpot for a while now, which was very surprising when we first saw it. Um, because it's so extensive in this lake, um, we're going to study it a little bit more because we're interested in its ecological uh, genetics. So it's uh, definitely an, an interesting find. So if you're working in freshwater ecosystems north of North Carolina, I would urge you to learn the difference between Monetius and Dioecious hydrilla and keep an eye out for these differing biotypes. So what we're doing about this hydrilla, first we're working to establish a more prominent native aquatic plant population at the lake that will introduce more competition for hydrilla and hopefully slow its spread around the lake. We understand that the effective management of invasive species requires an integrated approach that restores community structure, and these native vegetation plantings are an important aspect of that integrated system. So to do this, we built some native plant enclosures along the shoreline of Philpot Lake. Um, you can see an example of one that's been, that was built a few years ago. It has water willow inside of it, and our cages will hopefully look like this in a few years, but you can get the idea of um, how big they are and we, what we built them out of. It's just T posts and some wire sensing. Um, we are going to have these cages in fill pot and then plant um, more native plants in them over the years and hopefully create a nice native community around the lake that will give the hydrilla some competition. Um, we're also going to treat the hydrilla with some aqu uh, aquatic approved herbicides this summer um, in the high traffic areas like the boat launches and swimming areas and we'll continually monitor those sites as well. So to wrap things up, I'll just talk about the upcoming aquatic plant management work at these lakes that we're doing. First, like I just said, we're going to focus on our native vegetation cages and increase the biodiversity in them. We're going to do some treatments on the hydrilla and the Brazilian elodea, those invasive species at Philpot Lake. We are excited to study the site of hydrilla population in Philpot Lake and see if it's different than Florida populations that are um, also of the same biotype of hydrilla. And then this coming summer, we're also going to continue monitoring, mapping the aquatic vegetation in Philpot Lake and the rest of the Wilmington District Lakes as well. So that's all I have prepared for my time here. I'd like to thank you all for taking the time to listen in on this conference and also to CESU for allowing me to be part of this day. Um, I think I'm pretty short on time, but feel free to email questions to me or my advisor, Dr. Rob Richardson, and we'll be happy to chat with you. Thank you. Thank you, Kara. You're actually right on time. You timed it very well, and, and as we don't have any questions in the chat box, um, I'm going to just thank you for your presentation, and we will move on to the next presenter. Thank you very much. Up next, we have uh, Daniel Gleason from Georgia Southern University, and I have to admit that he has one of the most intriguing phrases of any title <laughs> box. Uh, drifting for knowledge sounds like what our undergraduates do in the spring on the weather turns. Uh, Daniel, if you'll enlighten us as to what all that means, uh, I believe we'll have your slide up here in just a second. All right, thank you. I'll be happy to. So I'm uh, Danny Gleason. I'm from Georgia Southern University, and today I'd like to discuss with you a project that we conducted uh, investigating connections between the river systems and the offshore reef systems in Georgia. And I'll just say right up front that this particular project would not have been possible without a 
outstanding partnership with uh, the National Marine Sanctuary Program, particularly the Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary and the Georgia Department of Natural Resources. The origin of this project comes from our location in the South Atlantic Bight, which runs from about Cape Canaveral, Florida to Cape Hatteras, North Carolina. And in this region, we have a very shallow shelf that extends out a long way off the coast of Georgia. And if you go out onto this shelf, what you'll find is that there are rocky hard bottoms that are very nice, nice reef systems. They are, they're populated by a range of invertebrate species, and they also sustain good fish populations. We had developed the hypothesis that these offshore reef communities are affected by nutrients and contaminants that are discharged from the, the rivers in Georgia. The reason we had this hypothesis about nutrients was because the water clarity is not, not real great off our coast. Uh, there are a lot of nutrients in the, in the water column, and uh, there's a lot of phytoplankton growth. And so these are really not phototrophic systems. So we believe that they're sustained fraud by uh, nutrients and other materials that are coming in from the outside. Uh, this relates to the outwilling hypothesis, something that was developed by Eugene Odom quite a few years ago. And we decided to test the most basic prediction of this hypothesis, that there are physical linkages between the estuaries and the reefs. Now, the way we decided to do that is um, we decided to focus on the Altamaha River watershed. Uh, this is one of the largest uh, river outflows on the eastern seaboard. You can see it drains nearly a quarter of the state of Georgia. And down here in the lower, lower right, you can see where the star is, the Altamaha River watershed. And one of our target locations offshore, Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary, was a, which is about 17 nautical miles offshore. So what we did was we decided to have two study components. We used a, a rhodamine WT dye, which is a water tracing dye. And this was to simulate dissolved substances that would be coming out of the river. Uh, we also uh, built drifters, satellite-enabled drifters, that were designed to simulate floating debris, such things as spartina grass that, that might be coming out of the marsh systems. We had uh, four total deployments. We conducted deployments in May and September in 2014 and 2015. Uh, these were funded by a coastal incentive grant from uh, Department of Natural Resources. On each one of these deployments, we deployed about 190 liters of rhodamine, rhodamine WT, which is a non-toxic dye, but you can see it was very effective at, uh, at actually staining the water out there off the coast. We chose May and September specifically because May is a period of time of of uh, very high rainfall, so higher output out of the river systems, and September is a period of lower rainfall. To detect the dye offshore, we used a we used fluorometers, field fluorometers that we deployed at uh, five reef sites that are basically in an arc around our drop site, and these were fitted with rhodamine WT sensors. The drifters. Um, we had uh, school groups and other conservation organizations come in and participate in workshops. These were organized and hosted by Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary. And so we had these groups come in and build these, these satellite-enabled drifters. We used primarily biodegradable materials, as much biodegradable material as we could get because we uh, believed we probably, and we were correct, that we would never retrieve these again. And, uh, and so these were made out of bamboo, uh, bamboo mast with bamboo spars and cotton drop cloth and cotton rope and other things, things that we thought would biodegrade over time. Now, where did the rhodamine go? Well, if you, what we did initially is we tracked the rhodamine offshore by eye until the first tidal change. And it didn't matter whether we dropped the, the rhodamine in the, the fall or the spring. Um, and we found that it would track to the southeast at about 1 to 1.8 kilometers per hour. All right, then we would leave the sites, leave the rhodamine, or leave the uh, fluorometers in place to detect the dye as it passed. We actually detected the dye passing through one time, and it actually 
passed through Cat Reef, which was located uh, 48 kilometers north of our drop site, and it took about four days for the die to reach that point. Now, this is completely opposite to what the oceanographers had told us would happen. They, they had modeled this and figured that it would come out of the river and then get caught in the longshore current and head south. And you can see that's definitely not what happened. Well, what about the drifters? Well, the drifters were an interesting story. I'm going to show you one here for the sake of time, one year here. But the result that we obtained was uh, very similar in both years. Uh, the panel on the upper left shows our uh, drifter deployment in May. We deployed, a two, we deployed two drifters. And what you can see is that they, they made it offshore, so they were able to escape, escape the longshore current. And then they drifted over 96 days all the way off the coast, uh, one of them all the way off the coast of Massachusetts out in deep water of the Atlantic. Now, if you look at the lower panel on the left side, even though the path in the upper panel looks fairly straightforward, when you look at the lower panel and we zoom in, you can see it was a very circuitous route. So they were affected by the tides. They came in and out. They passed through the sanctuary eight days after release, but eventually made it offshore and up the coast. On the right panel, we have the drifters in September when there's much lower flow out of the river. And you can see in the upper panel that the drifters really did not make it offshore at all. And when you look at the lower panel, you can see that the drifters started heading offshore. And then they were sucked back up into the sanctuary. And in fact, they got trapped up there. So to go back to our hypothesis, um, um, the prediction, are there physical linkages between estuaries and the reefs? Well, we can say now that yes, there is, but it really depends on the prevailing conditions. So what we think is going on is that during the springtime, when there's significant water outflow, the materials are able to escape the longshore current, and they're able to supply the reef systems offshore. Uh, during the fall, this is not the case. They get trapped and pulled up in the estuaries. Now, this uh, project that we conducted did give us an opportunity to produce some, some fairly significant outreach products. So we, uh, we actually created a manual, which is a guide to building ocean drifters. So if you have a group uh, that you know that would like to build one of these drifters and actually um, deploy them from your location, we'd be more than happy to supply you with this manual. And we've also created a video an instructional video that step by step will take you through uh, to building these drifters. And so we would encourage school groups, uh, conservation groups, whoever it might be, to, to do this because the more information we obtain on current patterns and where things are heading, uh, the better. Uh, we've also been able to place our entire drifter database online. Uh, this has been very useful to some school groups in our area. So what they've been able to do is they've been able to take their uh, students in math or students in geography and other disciplines have been able to go in and take this database and actually use it for their own purposes. And it's, it's available to anyone who would like to use it. And finally, we were, we were able to create a museum and exhibit for the Georgia Southern University Museum. This museum gets uh, more than 16,000 visitors per year. It's a natural history and a museum of the southeastern coastal plain. Uh, we created a video that's on a touch screen that, that visitors can come in and learn about the project. And then they can go to other areas on that touch screen so they can go in and see where they live and how they connect to the Atlantic and how they connect to the uh, Gulf of Mexico. They can go in and go through a process of building their own drifter using, um, using materials that are biodegradable, and then make predictions about where it would go. And with that, I think I am out of time. I'd just like to acknowledge all our uh, assister, assistance and logistical support. Thank you. Thanks, Danny. And you hit, that, hit the nail right on the head with the time. And I don't notice any um, questions down in the, in the chat in the chat area. So I will, again, just say thank you. And we'll, we'll keep on schedule and move on to the next presenter. Up, up next, we have uh, Joshua Allen.
Florida International University, Joshua. Joshua, we'll have your slide up there in a second, and you can there it is, and you can take it from here. Thanks. All right, thank you. I'm I'm, I'm Joshua Allen. I'm at Florida International University, um, studying under Dr. Renee Price. And this project that I'm working on uh, was evaluating the effectiveness of the L31 North Canal seepage barrier in the Florida Everglades, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that now. Um, so historically, the Everglades, as you see the left panel there, the water flow flowed from Lake uh, Okeechobee, overflowed into the Everglades, and flowed out to the Gulf of Mexico, Florida Bay, and even into Biscayne Bay on the east side. Uh, but then canals roads, the levees, and such, um, shunted that water flow to the Everglades to this panel to the right where we have a very small amount of fresh water flow through the Everglades because it's uh, pushed out to the east and west side of the state. <clears throat> but there are currently uh, uh, quite a few projects underway in order to try to restore that fresh water flow uh, through the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan, which was legislation that was passed in 2000 in order to try to restore some semblance of this pre-drainage water flow on the left panel there. <clears throat> so at the northern boundary of the Everglades, you can see in the top left panel, um, the, there's a, a road that cuts across there, and there, that's one of the things that shunted the water flow to the Everglades. So they built a one-mile bridge uh, to allow water to flow underneath that road. <clears throat> But there's a problem with keeping water in the Everglades as well. As you can see in the panel to the uh, uh, lower left there, those uh, potentiometric lines for the hydraulic gradient show that water is just going to flow east out of the Everglades. <coughs> the majority of it will flow east out of the Everglades to this canal called the L31 North Canal, which borders the east side of the Everglades at the northeast corner. So they built a seepage barrier along the west side of that canal that was 35 feet deep, 32 inches wide and two miles long, and they extended it to five miles <coughs> for 2017. So I uh, was able to go study, like, do some sampling in 20, 2015 and 2017, and it was trying to determine the effectiveness of the uh, seepage barrier itself, and to determine a geochemical tracer that can be used to elucidate groundwater and surface water exchange between Everglades National Park and the canal <coughs> adjacent to it. So I sampled uh, canal and marsh surface water and groundwater. So you can see the left three panels of the sampling design are from 2015, where I sampled canal surface water at several points along the uh, canal there for a seven-mile stretch. Um, the red line there in that panel shows the length of the seepage barrier at that time, the two-mile version. And then I, the groundwater sites are in the yellow in the middle. And then I sampled marsh surface water inside Everglades National Park, the third panel of the square. And then in 2017, I was able to go back. Uh, it wasn't um, originally planned, but after they did the five-mile stretch, I was able to go back and sample the surface water again, at least. Um, and you can see the length of the barrier there is the red line. Um, I analyzed for major cations and anions, as well as stable isotopes of hydrogen and oxygen. And oxygen isotopes ended up being the best indicator of this interaction between groundwater and surface water. I'll show you that in a little bit. I also calculated water budgets for uh, various segments of the canal itself. Um, the segments were determined by uh, existing flow meters that were there. So um, I was able to do from just north of the, uh, of the road where they put the one mile bridge as the blue segment up there. Um, down to mile one, and then uh, four subsequent segments after that. Um, the, I, so the, the bottom uh, in red, the, uh, the equation that I used for this water budget calculation was precipitation plus water flowing into each segment minus potential evapotranspiration minus the outflow from each segment minus the change in storage would equal groundwater seepage to determine how much water is moving in or out of the canal through groundwater exchange. Um, precipitation and potential evapotranspiration were uh, obtained from a weather station about six miles south of the extent of this figure. <clears throat> Inflow and outflow were obtained, those obtained from the flow meters that I told you about. And the change in storage was calculated from canal stage at each of those flow meters. Uh, I measured the surface area in ArcMap and um, did a difference in uh, canal stage at the north and south segment, uh, part of the segments there. 
Um, so since I told you that isotopes of oxygen ended up being the best indicator of this exchange, I just wanted to talk a little bit about isotopic fractionation in the water cycle. So uh, ocean water is uh, the standard for hydrogen and oxygen isotopes. Um, so it's zero per mil it's set to that. Um, and then it's lighter or heavier from there. So as water evaporates, the water vapor in the, in the air is lighter isotopically because they, I, they evaporate preferentially. So then rain condenses out of that water vapor and it becomes a little heavier because the heavier isotopes are the ones that are condensing together and they rain out. And then you can see a little canal, canal over there after that water has evaporated further, we get a heavier signal than originally um, from the ocean water. So I'm going to have to explain this figure. Um, so the y-axis on this upper figure is delta 18 oxygen uh, relative to standard mean ocean water. And then the x-axis is distance from Tamiami Trail, which is that road that I was speaking about where they put the one-mile bridge. So if you look at the little map on the bottom right, the yellow line would be the y-axis, and the uh, segment south of that would be the x-axis. So you can see the canal surface water is the blue uh, diamonds. And as we go next to the barrier, we start to we see the signal increase. Uh, the oxygen isotope value increases until after the barrier, and then it starts to decrease. In an open water system with no uh, inputs or outputs other than the water itself, we would expect those values to only rise with evaporation. So we see this lowering after mile three of the isotopic value, and that is uh, the only water that could be coming into there is groundwater from the park side. And you can see that the yellow dots are the groundwater <coughs> isotopic values, and they are much lighter than the surface water. So that water is moving into the canal after the barrier, but before the barrier, it's some, somewhat working. And you can see that in the lower figure. Um, the groundwater seepage is on the y-axis, and this is what was calculated from my water budget. A positive value in this figure means that groundwater is being added to the canal water. So this, um, there's a lot of input at the first S335 to M1 segment. And if you look at that little map again, that's because uh, before the barrier, uh, the barrier starts at the yellow line. Before that barrier, there's a lot of segment that was in there because there was no flow meter at the actual road. So I had to incorporate this large segment. So there's a lot of groundwater input, and then that decreases once we get next to the barrier. And it seems to actually go throughout the whole time. We get a lower and lower uh, input until we actually have surface water recharging groundwater at that last segment, M5 to M7, which is mile 5 to 7. In 2017, we saw the same thing isotopically, where we have this increase with evaporation and this obvious input of groundwater back into the canal, so this lowering of the isotopic values. But we see a little bit different in the uh, water budget below there. <clears throat> we, the same, we have a lot of input from the, the groundwater to surface water at the very beginning, and then it decreases until we get to the very end of the seepage barrier, and then we have a large input, again, from mile 5 to mile 7, which is right after the seepage barrier is there. So in wondering why this happened this way in 2015 versus 2017, um, I just, just gathered some very uh, simple to look at data here. Um, first of all, 2015 was a drought year, so we had very little rain that year. This is just for October, um, that upper left figure. Um, we had an 80% increase in precipitation from 2015 to 2017. And the lower left figure is discharge underneath that one mile bridge. The discharge beneath the bridge is much lower in 2017, but that's because there was a lot more water in the park and those, those things are controlled through uh, structures within each of the canals. But the big thing here, the lower right figure, um, higher, there's a higher hydraulic gradient from Everglades National Park to the canal from 2015 to 2017. There's a foot difference in the um, sl the the stage in the in the Everglades National Park, which is very huge for the Everglades, um, it's a very low lying land, and there is not much water. 
there. So a foot is a very large amount. So in conclusion, the seepage barrier is effective in reducing the groundwater and surface water exchange between Everglades National Park and the L31 North Canal. And stable isotopes of oxygen have proven to be viable tracers of groundwater surface water exchange in the area. Uh, and in the future, I would like to um, use these oxygen isotopes in order to see um, exchanges in groundwater and surface water in other areas of South Florida. And with that, I will be finished. Perfect, right on time. Thank you, Joshua, for, for an excellent presentation. I'm going to add my email address. Perfect. If you will type that down in the uh, in the text box, then everyone will have that. There you go. Thank you. All right. Okay. Up next, we have uh, also from Florida International University uh, our next presenter, Jay Saw. I hope I'm pronouncing the last, last name correctly. With a, with a name like Belli, I get sensitive to that sort of thing. Jay, are you there? Yeah, I'm there. Thank you. I, I'm Jay Sa from Florida International University. And uh, I will be talking on today the vegetation dynamics along hydrology gradient in mud and peat dominated wetlands in Everglades. But before I go on that topic, I would like to introduce my lab, our lab that, that is South Florida Terrestrial Ecosystem Lab, which is at Florida International University under CERC, Southeast Environmental Research Center. And we work in the Everglades Mars, uh, we work in the tree islands, coastal wetlands. Uh, pine rocklands, all different systems of the South Florida from the Everglades to the Keys. And our major funding agency is the Army Corps of Engineers, that uh, is the for monitoring projects and uh, National Park Service. Army, Army Corps of Engineers funding comes through the ADAC from the Missouri office, and National Park Service funding comes through the ENP. Occasionally, we get the funding from the USGS and uh, Fish and Wildlife Service too. Army Corps of Engineers funding and NPS funding are mostly through the recover, close recover program of the CERP, uh, like the Everglades Restoration Program, and certainly all these uh, projects come through the CSU. That means that the, all this uh, contract or through the CSU are happening. After this, I will present in my work that is the This is just conceptual model, the three systems, uh, like I will present today, the Mal Prairie, Region Slough, and Tree Islands. So there is the hydrology gradient from the Mal Prairie, which is the short hydroperiod, a system to the Region Slough where we have the long hydroperiod systems. And in Tree Island also, there are the high ground, and there are the low grounds, and that the hydrologic, there is the hydrologic gradient. Since in Everglades, the hydrology is the main driver, so we usually study the vegetation responses, vegetation community, plant community responses to the hydrologic changes. And this is our conceptual model for these three systems uh, for our detailed world. First, I will say something about this uh, Mal Prairie, which is uh, like the short hydroperiod and which are both sides of the Sark River Slough and the Taylor Slough. And this Mal Prairie system is important because this is the habitat of the Indian yard species, Capsable Seaside Sparrow, which was which is federally listed Indian yard species. And this sparrow is endemic to the endemic also and Indian yard also that is existing only within the Everglades National Park and part of the Big Cypress National Reserve. So that's why, and this, uh, since this species uh, occurs in only in the short hydro period, so it drives most of the hydrologic management in the Everglades. Our project one is that the monitor the vegetation responses along the Mount Prairie to the slough gradient. And we have the five transects here. I saw only three of them. There are two, which is under that figure, the bar diagram, uh, that white figure. Uh, here, I pointed out. I want. I would like to point out that the vegetation in these systems, whether it is mal prairie or it is in the slough, responds to the how the water is managed within the system. 
the arrows of there along the Tamiami Trail shows that these are the water structures have practicing the restricted water delivery in the park. And what we see that here, this is the bar diagram which shows the change in vegetation in third hydro period between 2007 and 2016 over nine years. The sites which are west of the Sark Slough, this is the Sark in the center, that is the Sark Slough in the slough portions. Western Mal Prairie is showing the drying trend over those years. Whereas in the eastern Mal Prairie are showing the wetting trend. And that is because of the water is managed like that. The restricted water delivery is letting those area dry west of the Sark Slough, whereas there is the there is the construction of the retention ponds along the eastern boundary and that is the seepage from those ponds are wetting the area or rocky glares, rock, rock pine, sorry, rocky glares. And that is the objective of the management and vegetation is responding to those changes. But in the slow area, in the slow area, there is the over the period because we had the data back in 1999. So over the period between 99 and now, the slough area has dried up. And when it dries up, then there is the increase in the sawgrass on expense of the other wetland species, mostly like the Utricularia species and other wetland species. And the, there is a reduction in the slough plants, uh, slough species, and the increase in the sawgrass and some spikeless species. And accordingly, there is the changes in the species richness also, especially along the transit three, there is the increase in the species richness when they dry off. In the sludge area, we have another project that we monitor throughout the systems, like from northern Everglades to the southern Everglades, and our panel is by two by five kilometer panels that we call the primary sampling units, PSUs, and within that also we have monitored the vegetation, we have sampled the vegetation over five years, and this figure shows the condition of the region slope pattern throughout the systems. And we have the, the different uh, indicators how we characterize that. Here I presented one that is called the vegetation community distinctness. When ridge and slope, there is the distinct vegetation between ridge and slope that is in the preserved area where the ridge and slope system is well preserved. But when those vegetations come close to each other, that means there is some damage or the ridge and slope pattern is uh, damaged or not so good. So in these systems, what we see that the central northern central water conservation area 3A, where the green panels are, those are the preserved systems. But for other other areas like water conservation area 3B, northern water conservation area 3A, and even some of the Everglades National Park, the region slope patterns are not the preserved one and they have gone through the different kinds of the destructions of due to the water condition changes in the water conditions there and that is mainly because of the compartmentalizations in that area and the flow is not maintained throughout the systems. Next is our tree island work. In the tree island, we monitor the tree islands and how the vegetation is responding on tree islands. And in the Everest National Park, the tree islands is very complex. That is different kinds of the vegetation along the gradient. The tree islands are oriented from north to south uh, along the parallel to the water flow directions. And what we see that at the north northern portion, there is the hammock, hardwood hammock, which is rarely flooded. But in the middle, we call it bay head. And in the 
lower end there is the bay head swamp and then the sawgrass tail. This figure represents the uh, splitting uh, moving window techniques where that uh, shows that where the breakage are between the communities, plant communities. And what we did that we have we sampled those transects in a couple of islands over uh, 10 years back in 2001 and then 2012. And since the tight period was the drier than the period before, like before 2000, 90s were very uh, wet. So what vegetation responded to that and there was increase in the flood intolerant species or flood moderately tolerant species like the Chrysobalanus ecaico, but the pond apple like the Nona glabra that decreased in abundance and that was through the tail region especially where those species are dominant and there was not much changes in the hardwood hammock. So what we concluded from this that even the well, drier episodes of the 10 years or one decade can let the tree island grow. Uh, can let the tree island grow by increasing in the woody species. There was uh, on the expense of the other species like the marsh species, the woody species increases those areas. And that changes even the boundary between the plant communities as well as the tree island and the Mars community. And that how to accelerate or to facilitate the monitor to monitor those changes, we are now developing the fine scale map of the those tree islands and our resolution is two by two meter. At that scale, we characterize the vegetation and we are mapping the um, uh, tree islands. Uh, we have so far done the six, I six islands in the Evandrius National Park and we are doing now in water conservation area 3B. And that will let, the mon let, the mon let us monitor the vegetation change over time without going in the field. So this is our new um, uh, methodology that we are trying to adopt in for the tree island things. And especially there was one question recently that how many tree islands are there, what are the vegetations? It's, we don't know actually the total number of the tree islands. Many areas are not mapped very well or counted very well. So I hope that this will be, uh, this will help us to uh, do that or to uh, accelerate that process. And finally, all these, whatever the vegetation uh, responses we are seeing through, uh, to the uh, hydrologic changes or related variables like when there is the changes in hydrology, there is changes in the fire frequencies and uh, fire uh, severity also. So we are now developing the vegetation dynamics modeling models uh, that is uh, using the Elvis model that was developed by the park. Everglades landscape vegetation succession model, and we are using that. We are improve, we are working on that model, improving that uh, tools, and we are planning to we are planning to use all those vegetation things, vegetation dynamics, vegetation responses to the different drivers, are uh, in different systems, including the mile prairie. Currently, we are working on the mile prairie, but we are planning to extend to the region slope and other coastal regions also. So with this, I, I will thank uh, the CSU organizer for this meeting, and thank you very much. Thank you, Jay. Um, I don't see any questions down in the chat window. Uh, there's uh, Jay's, uh, Jay's information, so we'll, we'll move on. We'll keep going on to the next presentation. We have uh, up next, Ian Fink from the University of Miami. And Ian, if you are on, I see your slide up there, so I'll turn it over to you. All righty, thank you very much. And uh, hello, everyone. I will be presenting today on a summary of the Integrated Biscayne Bay Ecological Assessment and Monitoring, or IBEAM, program. 
given the uh, time allotment of 10 minutes, uh, be able to provide you with an overview of the program and the wide array of products that it has generated. Uh, it's kind of a short time period to do so, so uh, I will be using the majority of the allotted time for the presentation. And I will try to address any questions you have uh, briefly at the end of the presentation, or we can uh, continue a conversation offline later on. Um, I would like to also point out that this is a partnership program between the University of Miami and National Park Service, NOAA, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and the South Florida Water Management District. I-BEAM conducts habitat monitoring and assessment in support of Comprehensive Everglades Plan Implementation, or SERP. SERP is the largest ecological restoration project ever attempted. Within the SERP framework, the Restoration Coordination and Verification, or RECOVER, multi-agency team of resource specialists assist with system-wide planning uh, by conducting scientific and technical evaluations and assessments. The monitoring and assessment plan is the primary tool used by Recover to assess SERP ecological impacts. I-BEAM is comprised of four components of the Southern Coastal Systems module, which is a component of the Recover map. I hope everyone is awake and following along as there may be an acronyms quiz at the end here. Uh, I-BEAM was founded in 2012 in order to combine four previously independent monitoring efforts. Biscayne Bay Salinity Monitoring Network, Near Shore Submerged Aquatic Vegetation, which throughout the remainder of the talk I'll be uh, referring to as a SAV community, the Longshore Epifauna, and the Mangrove Fish. I-BEAM took advantage of efficiencies derived from combining efforts and cooperative sampling to maintain continuity of these four monitoring efforts, giving uh, reduced funding. However, sampling and spatial extent was reduced to fit the, uh, the reduced funding. All four projects have been extensive period of record that extends prior to the creation of I-BEAM in 2012. And I-BEAM ecological monitoring is intended to assess implementation of the Biscayne Bay Coastal Wetlands Project, a specific construction and freshwater operations component of SERP, which you can see depicted over there on the, uh, the right map. First, the Salinity Monitoring Network is consists of water quality data loggers at 44 locations that monitor water depth, temperature, and salinity at 15-minute intervals on a 24-7, 365 basis. Uh, the red points on the map identify 17 locations that were included within the I-Beam project. Uh, this period of record extends back to 2004, and in 2010, we increased um, number of locations in the near shore in order to obtain better resolution in the salinity regime located there. The salinity monitoring network data is used to track seasonal condition of four derived indices, the mesohaline index, the hyperhaline index, salinity variability index, and a composite salinity regime suitability index. The Biscayne Bay computed index values for each salinity site are compared to an index values computed from salinities observed in the downstream Joe Bay monitoring site, which is highlighted on the map with the red circle and the arrow there at the bottom. These uh, salinities at the downstream Joe Bay site are, was selected as representative of anticipated post-SERP nearshore Biscayne Bay salinity conditions. And on the right there, you can see a matrix of mesohaline index values over a recent period of record, indicating poor mesohaline character in the northern half of the monitoring areas, as well as poor mesohaline character during certain year seasons in the southern half of the domain. Each wet season, random sampling uh, occurs within the 500 meter shoreline buffer. Uh, these surveys are conducted to, in order to construct large-scale benthic habitat mapping. During the sampling, geotagged high-resolution digital photographs of the substrate are collected to later score percent cover, diversity, and distribution of SAB species. These images are collected either on board the shallow water positioning system vessel, seen in the upper left, or by snorkelers in the water. In addition, physical water quality and light attenuation measurements are collected. 
Occurrence and density data from the SAV community surveys is used to produce temporal trajectories as well as multiple regression habitat suitability relationships. Here we can see trends for the seagrass hollow dual righty. H righty exhibits a stable occurrence trend across the period of record, but only after recovery from reduced density following the extreme cold front event in 2010. And on the upper or in the uh, right side of the slide, you can see H righty occurrence is predicted to maximize at low salinities ranging from 20 or from 0 to 20 ppt. Each dry and wet season belt transect surveys are conducted by a snorkeler to investigate mangrove fish communities. During the survey, taxonomic identity, number, and size structure characteristics are recorded for observed fishes. Prior to each survey, water quality and mangrove shoreline type are also recorded. Occurrence and density data from the mangrove fish surveys are used to produce temporal trajectories as well as multiple regression habitat suitability relationships. Here you can see trends in the gold spotted killifish, Floridicthes carpio. F carpio exhibits higher occurrence and density in the dry season and decreasing density occurrence trends across the period of record. F carpio density is predicted to maximize at 20 ppt. And also each dry and wet season throw trap surveys are completed at alongshore sampling sites, which comprise the epifaunal uh, community surveys. Prior to throw trapping, water quality measurements are recorded, SAV communities are assessed, and throw trapping, uh, the throw trap is deployed a total of three times for replica sampling of epifaunal communities at each site. Again, occurrence and density data are from the surveys are used to produce temporal trajectories as well as multiple regression habitat suitability relationships. Here we can see trends in the for the pink shrimp Farfana pineus durarum, depicted in the lower right there. Uh, F. durarum exhibits higher occurrence and density in the dry season and stable occurrence but generally decreasing density trends across the period of record and F. durarum density is predicted to maximize at approximately 20 ppt. I'd like to switch gears and also describe some of the research that we are producing using this data collected during the, uh, from the I-Beam program. Uh, on the left, the Biscayne Bay Salinity Model, or BBSM, is a two-dimensional hydrodynamic model that emulates current regime's temperature and salinity within Biscayne Bay. During a recent update to its fourth development version, the BBSM used I-Beam salinity monitoring network data to calibrate and validate the model. And salinity monitoring network data has been used to develop temporally integrated halo habitat metrics. For example, 35-day antecedent mean salinity, that is the mean of salinity, over the 35 days prior to a specific sampling event, the mean of, that, of those salinity records was used to develop a predictive regression for pink shrimp density based on the salinity habitat experience at that location prior to each sampling event. In this case, the BBSM was then used to model 35-day antecedent salinity in order to predict pink shrimp habitat suitability for wet and dry seasons using a base case scenario and a high flow or high canal discharge scenario. SFA, SAV community monitoring has led to a number of publications regarding benthic habitat dynamics in the near shore of Biscayne Bay. Analyses conducted using this SAV data has suggested that we shift away from emphasis of increased H. righty occurrence or abundance, um, which is currently the focus of SERP implementation, and place more emphasis on development of a mixed species seagrass bed. Mangrove fish community data has led to a number of publications which have defined fish communities within Biscayne Bay, assessed the nursery role of nearshore mangrove habitats, and identified connectivity linkages between nearshore mangroves and offshore reefs. More specifically, spatial temporal habitat suitability of gold spotted killifish has been mapped. 
and during my recent dissertation research, I conducted spatial temporal analyses of pink shrimp density, a SERP indicator species. Uh, these analyses revealed a spatial clustering of pink shrimp densities that indicated locations more influenced by canal discharges and thus exhibiting lower salinity were characterized by low or moderate pink shrimp densities. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and your time and again take a moment to recognize the uh, partnerships listed at the bottom of this slide there as well as the many technicians that have all contributed to this project over time. Thank you. Thank you, Ian, and I'd like to thank all the uh, presenters up to this point for uh, making me look good as a moderator because you've all been almost exactly on time with your presentation. I don't see that there's any questions, so at this point, um, I believe I can turn over moderator, moderator duties to Helena, uh, and she can take you through the rest of the afternoon. Thank you, Keith. Um, can you hear me? <coughs> yes. Yes, um, so thank you so much for uh, uh, moderating the first half of the uh, ten, me ten minute speaker sessions, and at this point, I'd like to continue on to the next half and introduce Henry Bersenio of Florida International University, who will be speaking about phosphorus levels in Shark River School. Henry? Yes, here I am, but I don't see my slides. There, there. Okay. Okay, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, this project uh, related to phosphorus and the date, something that very common for most people, uh, is uh, funded by the National Park Service. And fundamentally, uh, I'm going to be discussing uh, 16 slides in eight minutes, eight to nine minutes. So it's quite a rush. So let's go for it. And uh, next slide. Uh, that's the problem. We have some spikes of uh, phosphorus in water in the water column of those canals in the water conservation area 3A and in most canals around the Everglades area. So next slide. The hint we had when we began this project is that there was some kind of relationship between TP in the water column and water level, the stage, either at the canal site or at the marshes surrounding that place. Next slide. And uh, that was the area of interest for the National Park the intersection between the Tamiami Canal and the L67A Canal, and uh, the station or the structure uh, S333, I'm going to call it triple three species, is right there. And besides that, we have some stations located upstream L67A and also upstream the Tamiami Canal from this side. Next slide, please. Okay, the request from the park was identify the sources of elevated TP uh, that structure and if possible, characterize them as if they were local, uh, the origin was local, or uh, came from uh, upstream uh, L67A or even beyond that. That means uh, Everglades agricultural area or something, okay? So uh, next, please. So first, we try to develop some kind of conceptual model uh, to uh, try to explore what the relationship could be between the different uh, components of, uh, of, uh, of the environment and the different uh, storage areas. And, uh, well, as usual, uh, conceptual models look like a, a plate of uh, spaghetti. So I'll just go into the right side and see the, the diagram in color there. So we have in the water first, we have water coming from upstream. That's a green arrow. And then we have exchanges with, uh, with the sediment, uh, brown, and uh, uh, clock. Uh, kind of pink, and also with the uh, marshes nearby. Plus, we have some kind of exchanges with uh, groundwater. That's what we should take into consideration for our model. And then for the sediment, something similar. Uh, in this case, with the sediment pile at the site, sediment coming from upstream, and also uh, exchange with the marshes. So, next slide. So, first, we try to confirm the relationship between water level and, uh, and uh, TP. And it is, in fact, it's not only for that uh, S333, but everywhere. Uh, it's not only that it's uh, within the water conservation 3A, but it's also in the Everglades agricultural area. Uh, 
I selected station 150 and I did the same and we got the same kind of relationship. Higher puffers when we have low uh, water levels. And also, a station which is upstream in uh, Tamiami Canal, uh, the, water, the water shack upstream from that station are marshes. It's not any direct canal contribution. And uh, even there, we have the same kind of relationship. So it's, uh, it's regional. And doesn't have, and look like doesn't have anything to do with the uh, land cover land use. That's, you know, initial uh, gut feeling about this. Next slide, please. So we need a little more exploration of the time series, uh, uh, not just this plot that we had before. And we use cumulative zoom curves. This curve, you have to look just at the slope and changes of slopes in the curve. And that expresses the, the rate of change, in this case of TP along this uh, water level uh, uh, gradient. So for uh, TP below seven water, uh, uh, feet of water level, we have a very steep slope, so we have a high concentration of 19 ppb in average. When it, uh, when it goes from seven to eight feet, concentration declines to 12 ppb. And when it goes beyond eight feet, it drops below average now to, down to uh, nine ppb. So that eight feet uh, uh, threshold indicates that we have for lower uh, water level, we have higher concentrations and we have uh, uh, lower concentration for above uh, that water level. That kind of relationship between seven and 8.5 feet holds for all the agricultural areas all these stations we tested. Next slide, please. So we also tried to find relationship with some other parameters like turbidity. And we found, in this case, we also found some interesting relationship. In this case, we see that below 1.4 NTU, the slope is negative. So that means below average. So that means that for waters with uh, turbidity less than 1.4, concentration of puffer is very low. And as soon as it goes beyond that uh, level, it goes to above average. But also we have found a relationship with the uh, time of the day the sample was taken. So perhaps that has to do with, uh, uh, next slide, has to do with uh, uh, insulation. So uh, perhaps, next slide please. Perhaps there is a, thank you. There is a, a relationship with uh, some biotic component. So in summary, this preliminary conclusions, we have that there is some Interplay of hydraulic setting with a water level and residence time, perhaps, and then maybe some sediment uh, erosion of a flock and sediments. There's some organic activity, and the scale is regular. It's not only uh, one specific site. It's mostly related to canal relationship and is independent of uh, land cover and use. Next slide, please. Okay, so we. Working with this model, like a Redis model of 2011, we go from the, the marshes to what's going on in the canal. That's our next step. Next uh, slide, please. So what we did, we collected sediments and flock, and we uh, proceed to do a fractionation of uh, what uh, the phosphorus in those, uh, those samples. And we use a, a progressive uh, extraction using first the ionized water, so, you know, very light uh, extraction methodology. Then we use sodium bicarbonate, sodium hydroxide, and finally hydrochloric acid to extract the carbonate bound uh, 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 phosphorus. So, with that in mind, next slide please, we, uh, we see that the water extracts very little and the sodium uh, bicarbonate and sodium hydroxide are, are just about the same and most of the extraction is with uh, uh, hydrochloric acid. Next slide, please. And then if we see for, for flock, uh, we see the different stations. We see that uh, regionally, you know, you know, it's not the same everywhere. So flock is not a flock, the same flock everywhere. Uh, that's what is important. Next one, please. And uh, what is interesting in this diagram is that uh, the, uh, when we incorporate the stations uh, on the marshes, it's M station, M1 to M7, we see that the contribution from those sediments are very, very small as compared of what comes from the sediments in and flock in the, in the canal. Next slide, please. So with that in mind, we, we have now uh, the second phase of this project is just to do uh, uh, a new, a project in which we'll have 
At each one of those stations, uh, marked in blue, will deploy uh, current meters with PCM1s to measure the, the velocity of the current at the, at the bottom. And then we also will take samples and we do a lot of different measurements. And finally, we'll use that data for uh, a modeling effort together with Dr. Uh, Reynaldo Garcia, who's going to be talking later today about 5 p.m. this afternoon. And uh, next slide, please. And uh, the idea is just to see how at the bottom of the canal or from the marshes, what's the contribution to the canal waters and how that varies with all these uh, parameters that we have been trying to uh, unravel in this initial program. Next slide, please. And I thank you very much for your time. And I thank the National Park Service and mostly to my friend, uh, Geoffrey Castro, who introduced me to this project. Thank you very much. Thank you, Henry. Um, we have about one minute um, for questions and answers. And also, during this period, Kelly McCarter is going to be switching over slides um, because of the limitation in the file sizes. So um, at this point, um, I'd like to see if there are any ask if there are any questions. Um, I had a question. Um, I thought the eight foot line uh, where on either side you get a decrease in the phosphorus levels to be fascinating. Um, any idea as to what that eight foot is maybe physically related to? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What diagram do you mean? Yes, it was a plot where you had um, a ma like a b uh, uh, maximum level of phosphorus when the water level was eight feet, and it was interesting that the phosphorus levels would decrease. It was above that that uh, it would decrease no, when oh, the water level. In those diagrams, it's not that you have a maximum there. What you have is that when you have positive slope, you have above average values. The steeper the slope, the higher the concentration. So. In those diagrams, you see that first, you have a very steep slope. It's 19 ppb average for that piece of, uh, of the line plot, and then 12. And then at that 8 feet is when concentration drops below average and gives you a negative slope in the curve. These curves are, are, are tricky, but are very illustrative once you, 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 get, in, you, know, you get familiar with them. So when the... Uh when the phosphorus decreases with lower water levels, do you think that's settling the particles out of the water column? That, you know, that there is conflicted information because you would think that uh, with a lower water level, you, you would have less uh, velocity, uh, current velocity. And uh, in some instances, that, that's not what we, we are seeing with the data set. And uh, so, I don't know. We we need to do. That's why we are we are setting up this uh, uh, this uh, program using the current meters at the bottom of the canal where we have this uh, uh, segments and flock and see how this material behaves under different conditions of water level. Thank you very much, Henry. Thank you so much. You bet. Thank you very much. I don't see any other questions in the chat window. Kelly, are you ready to switch over? Okay, at this point, um, I'd like to uh, go ahead and introduce Lincoln Larson of North Carolina State University, who will be speaking about citizen science. Lincoln? Hey there, Helena. Uh, remind me, should I use video or not for this? I can see you fine. All right, then I'll roll with video. I just didn't want to mess up the streaming options for others here. Um, so I want to talk today, shifting gears here, to uh, conservation social science and some work we've been doing looking at broader themes that might be possible uh, to explore with respect to citizen science and conservation outcomes, looking at some pilot research we've done, and then thinking about next directions and what types of collaboration might be possible. Uh, so I'm talking about work I've been doing with my collaborator, Karen Cooper, here at NC State and several others uh, that I could mention as, as things progress here. So I guess we're not doing video. That's okay. Uh, 
to facilitate the transition to conservation social science and to keep things up to speed here, I just want to briefly mention what citizen science is. Most of you, I presume, are at least uh, tangentially familiar with it. But citizen science confers a unique advantage that the traditional approach to science is not. If we think about scientist-led projects, they're often top-down. Um, they tend to be uh, often not always slower and global in nature. Citizen science, on the other hand, is more bottom-up more often than not. It tends to or originate in local settings with local people. Uh, it tends to move more quickly as a result. And it can generate different types of outcomes as a result. And so one of the reasons we're really interested in, in citizen science is to look at all these diverse outcomes. And this model here is somewhat complicated, but I want to draw your attention to a couple things, a couple things that citizen science can do. One thing it does exceptionally well is generate knowledge, data. Uh, knowledge acquisition by acquiring science. Um, that's part of the origin there is the idea of crowdsourced data collection, expanding horizons, expanding our capacity to answer scientific questions. Uh, the other thing citizen science can do, something that I would argue is often overlooked, but perhaps uh, equally if not more important, is this fostering engagement piece, uh, which means people actually interacting with whatever the topic is. It could be natural resources. Uh, it could be anything citizens within the realm of citizen science. We'll focus on natural resources for the sake of today. But that engagement can lead not just to scientific knowledge through the science acquisition, but also to learning outcomes, potentially to conservation behavior. And some of the work we're doing is suggesting that those outcomes, whether they're focused on conservation or recreation, those outcomes stemming from that public engagement piece might be just as, as important to conservation as the scientific data generation component. And so that's some of the things that we're starting to explore that I thought might be of interest to the audience here today. Lincoln, um, I got a note from Kelly that the video limits the audio. So just to improve the clarity, if you can turn off the video. Thank you. Yeah, my video should be off now, I think. Um, I'm used to that from online teaching, too, so I've run into that barrier before. <laughs> so hopefully you can all still follow along. And it might be even better you don't have to look at me this way. Uh, study background of this pilot study I want to mention. One of the questions we're asking is, how does citizen science participation, different types of participation, influence conservation behaviors? Uh, to start to answer this, we've looked at it with a few different data sets. One of them was Audubon's 116th Christmas bird count. So we work with Audubon to do an assessment of Everyone participating in the bird count, uh, not everyone responded. You can see the sample size there. And we really wanted to focus on individuals who only participated in bird-related citizen science projects. So we'll call them birders, and that was about two-thirds of the sample. And individuals who participated in all other types of citizen science projects, too. So they weren't just birders or Christmas bird counters. Uh, they did all sorts of other things, ranging from water quality monitoring uh, to some astronomy projects, some geology projects, lots with biodiversity. Uh, and that was about a third of the sample. So we had different groups here with different levels of participation. When we started to compare these two groups, we found that uh, somewhat contradicting our hypotheses that the birder group, the bird focus group, really spent less time engage with the Christmas bird count specifically. Um, and the naturalist group actually showed higher levels of environmental efficacy, science efficacy, greater likelihood of more in-depth participation on the Christmas bird count specifically. So kind of a broader range of science contributions here, not just to the bird projects, but to others. And everything else was fairly similar in terms of gender, race, Audubon membership, education level. So it was really the citizen science engagement piece and some of the outcomes associated which started to differ. And that's what I should add. That's what we're calling, uh, starting to call here the multi-project effect. When we look at conservation behaviors, we ran some regression models controlling for all sorts of demographic and cognitive variables. And the two best predictors of conservation behavior participation were environmental efficacy, which you might expect since that essentially measuring perceptions about one's ability to improve the environment. Behavioral literature would certainly support that. But the next best predictor, with everything else considered, was citizen science participation. 
particularly the number of different projects that people engaged in. So not just non, uh, not just bird projects, but the other stuff too. One of the best predictors of conservation behavior. And so if you look at this with a few figures here, when I'm talking about conservation behaviors, you can see a list of some of the things I'm talking about. These are things that can occur in both the public, uh, public or private sphere. So it could be making personal land more friendly for wildlife. It could be lobbying for habitat management or donating to conservation. And you can see on the whole suite of behaviors here, the naturalists were more likely to engage or had a higher probability of engaging in them than the birders in every case. So the people who are doing different types of citizen science projects more likely to participate. And a, an easier way to distill that and look at it without so many things going on is to break it down to moderate and high levels of conservation behavior. So moderate is people who did uh, four to six of these activities on a regular basis. High is people who did seven to nine or all of them on a regular basis. And comparing them to people who didn't do as many. And so if you look at moderate participation and you calculate through modeling predicted probability of participating in this suite of conservation behaviors, you see that naturalists were about 14% more likely than birders uh, to engage in moderate levels and about 20% more likely than birders to engage in conservation behaviors at high levels. So again, you, you see these same things playing out where the naturalists are more in tune, more in touch with, and more active with respect to conservation than people doing just the bird projects. So what can we learn from all of this? Well, I think the key lesson uh, from this particular pilot study is, is to achieve science and conservation goals, we need to help more birders become naturalists. And, and another way of looking at that beyond the bounds of the Christmas bird count is to think broadly about facilitating engagement in multiple types of citizen science projects so that you're no longer focused uh, on one audience, uh, a hobbyist group that only does one thing, but you're truly creating citizen scientists with the capacity to transcend disciplinary projects, boundaries, and, and, and try new things. Um, we've seen this with water quality monitoring projects that we've done. We've seen this with other types of projects that it's that diverse engagement which leads to greater learning and greater conservation outcomes. One of the ways that Karen and I are trying to leverage this now is through SciStarter, a, site, a website that she helped to co-found. It's a hub for, uh, now it's about 1,600 projects. You can use it to connect with other projects. You can create a profile and engage in multiple things at once. We have an NSF grant now to study uh, participation dynamics in citizen science using this SciStarter platform to understand how volunteers move across projects, what broader learning outcomes are derived, what projects are gateway projects to other things, how to facilitate communication. So we're really excited about this project and where it could lead and how it could integrate and leverage all the strengths of citizen science to help achieve conservation goals. So there's a lot going on with that, um, and one of the things, one of the reasons why I wanted to present today is to talk about this possibility, our interest in citizen science and the SciStarter platform, and to think about if any of you in your experience or in your agencies are working in this space and are interested in learning more about volunteers and how they can contribute to some of your management goals. I think there are a lot of opportunities here, and my contact information, if you see, is up here at the top. Uh, please reach out to me. I'd love to talk more about this and how we might be able to work with you on things. I want to leave you with this thought on, on citizen science. I know a lot of uh, land management agencies out there are struggling to balance conservation and recreation and what that means for resource protection. Uh, E.B. White said, when I rise every day, I'm torn between the desire to save the world and the desire to savor the world, reflecting that conservation recreation balance. This makes it hard to plan the day. And I would argue that if you plan on incorporating citizen science into your programs, you can actually accomplish both. And so that's what I wanted to convey today. Wow, your timing is perfect. Thank you so much, Larson. In the interest of time, uh, we will go ahead to the next presentation by Ali McCreary, who will be discussing cultural resources. Good afternoon. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, all right, my name is Allie McCreary. I am a postdoc with 
North Carolina State University, uh, the Department of Parks, Recreation, and Tourism Management. And I'm presenting some research today on behalf of myself and my colleagues, Drs. Aaron Seacamp and Sandra Faderich, um, where we looked at uh, how we can elicit expert opinions on climate adaptation of cultural resources. So I will dive right in. Um, if I can take my slide, here we go. So uh, cultural resource management, CRM, is really complicated by climate change, and this is particularly true in coastal areas where things like storm-related flooding, erosion, and sea level rise are just making it even more difficult for cultural resource managers to sustain historic structures and other resources on the landscape. Um, and managers like the National Park Service recognize this. Uh, NPS in particular has put out this memorandum and a report the cultural resources climate change strategy um, to try to address this complex management issue. Um, the report, the last bullet, doc, uh, documented seven different types of adaptation strategies that managers can take. Um, so what we wanted to do is understand um, for a park unit that has, you know, maybe a limited number of personnel working in cultural resource management, is there a way to elicit some remote expert opinion on which of these strategies is best for various cultural resources? So we developed a online survey um, that was focused on historic structures at Cape Lookout National Seashore. So there's two designated historic villages there. To the south is Cape Lookout Village and to the north Portsmouth Village, and we picked 18 buildings um, from each of the, uh, from the, these two villages, so 18 all together, um, to have some remote experts um, evaluate. And we did that through an online questionnaire. Um, we sent out a link to participate with a few reminders. Um, our sample was very strategic. We had the help of the Washington, D.C. and the Southeast Regional Office in identifying some cultural resource management experts. Um, so we sent the link out to them explaining the study and asking them to participate. Um, and this component I'm talking about today was just one part of the survey, but we asked them to review five randomly selected buildings um, from the 18 we had chosen. And they saw like a bit of a storytelling component, so historic use of the structure and then current use of the structure as well as some description of what it looked like. And then they were prompted to open a new tab and look at this geovisualization component um, where they saw a, a 360 imagery of the structure itself and then also some land cover data so they could look at kind of sea level rise um, or water inundation over time under both a moderate and high climate change scenario. And so after they read that story and worked through that geovisualization component, then they were asked, what is the best adaptation strategy in your opinion, and a few other questions that I'll show in the results in just a moment. So we had a total of 29 experts that participated in this component of the survey. Um, on average, they had been working in cultural resource management for about nine years and had been with the current organization for 13. So you can see um, almost half of the sample was federal sector, so likely the National Park Service personnel, although there were folks working at the state level for private agencies, um, academic institutions, and nonprofits. Uh, the sample was also biased towards the East Coast, so you can see those first four categories are the breakout of their regional affiliation. Um, and the last other is everything from Caribbean islands, Pacific islands, Midwestern and Western United States. So really focused on those um, national level East Coast experts. And this slide is just a quick overview just to give you an impression of some patterns that emerged from the data. So a blue shaded box indicates that that adaptation strategy was selected at least once for that particular structure. So you just to draw some major patterns here that improve resilience was selected at least once for every structure, right? While take offsite action was only selected for two of the structures. Um, and if this is of interest to you, we can get more into that if we have time for questions. I'm going to move on. Um, after the personnel were asked to select the adaptation strategy they thought was the best fit based on um, their knowledge of the of the building and of the land use change, they were then asked, how do you think 
this adaptation strategy would affect the overall cultural landscape at Cape Lookout National Seashore. Um, these are mean responses, uh, mean aggregated responses for each of the seven adaptation strategies, and you can see they all fall on the negative or the detract side of the scale here. So none of our experts felt that these adaptation strategies were going to enhance the cultural landscape. If anything, um, we had some neutrality with leave things as they are or improve resilience, but then a lot of uh, detract from the landscape through documenting and releasing buildings, um, taking off-site action and interpreting the change. We also found some interesting relationships between vulnerability and certainty of impact in the adaptation the strategy that was selected by these experts. So in addition to selecting the strategy and rating how it would affect the landscape, experts were also asked to um, rate how vulnerable they perceived the building to be um, on a scale of low, moderate, or high, and then to say how certain they were that it would be impacted, not at all, not, not very fairly or very. So when a building was perceived to be of low vulnerability, experts were really saying leave things as they are, right? Um, but if a building was highly vulnerable, then we got this sort of dichotomous um, response where either experts are saying put all of your resources into improving the re resilience or you know don't invest in the resource document and release that structure. Um, and sort of similar themes emerge with certainty of impact. When they were not at all certain, uh, the strategy most often selected was just to leave things as they are and manage the change occurring. Um, but if they were very certain of impact, again, um, they wanted to move that structure to relocate it or to document and release, maybe if relocation they did not feel was feasible. So what does this mean? Um, well, those last two metrics I showed you are somewhat more objective and so maybe easier for cultural resource management to, uh, managers to determine a building's certainty of impact and vulnerability and then based on that make their management, their adaptation decision. So it gives them some science-based evidence on, on why they chose a certain adaptation strategy, perhaps because of the building's uh, vulnerability or certainty of impact. So that helps them communicating their management decisions to policymakers or visitors or other stakeholders. Um, methodologically, I think the instrument was really uh, pretty useful and efficient in garnering that expert opinion um, from remote regions. Uh, it was a fairly small sample size, and uh, we had some drop-offs from the earlier components on the survey, um, so I think just additional prompts can help people along in using that technology. So looks like my time is up, but I will take any questions if we have time, or uh, you can shoot me an email as well. Thanks. Thank you, Ali. Thank you for the excellent presentation. At this point, again, in the interest of time, I'd like to move to the next presentation by Dwayne Estes, who will be discussing the southeastern gra grasslands. Thank you all. I appreciate it. Um, can you hear me okay? All right. The, um, so the Southeastern Grasslands Initiative, um, we may – our uh, – Focus is on the grasslands of the southeast, as we'll we'll talk about here in just a second. And uh, we we believe there's a need to chart a new course for conservation this century. Um, and we'll talk about that. Sorry. So when I was a, a grade school student in the sixth grade, growing up in Tennessee, one of the things that I remember learning about was this fanciful notion about how. The forests of the eastern U.S. were so dense and continuous from the Atlantic Ocean to the Mississippi River that this fabled squirrel could travel all the way across the continent, the eastern half of the continent, without touching the ground. And, of course, I think most of us realize that's not possible, but still we have that, that notion of what the pre-settlement vegetation and landscape of the eastern U.S. was like. And uh, my teacher, Tommy Johns, uh, who sort of gave me that um, or, or taught that to my class, Never really talked about grasslands, and I think had I been raised in Kansas or, you know, the Dakotas, I probably would have learned a, a different history. And so there's quotes like this one um, from Reuben Ross in 1812 that talk about countless numbers of bright flowers springing up in all directions, beautiful, massive grasslands, scarcely a tree in sight, where he sees pra the prairie bird or barren hen, which we now know is the greater prairie chicken. And these aren't, this reference is not from Kansas. This is from uh, central Kentucky, just about an hour north of Nashville, Tennessee, in 1812. 
And so the photo you see there is at Fort Campbell Army Base, just outside Clarksville, Tennessee. That is a four square mile open prairie, really treeless. And just to the north of that is a 25,000 acre prairie that is seven miles long and three and a half miles wide. Recently, Reed Moss, who now works for SGI, published The Forgotten Grasslands of the South. And it really highlights um, the, the ver variety and diversity of southern grasslands, which include prairies and savannas, uh, grass balds, a variety of rocky grasslands like glades and barrens, and then many different types of open wetlands from fens and bogs and wet meadows, et cetera. And so what happened to most of our grasslands is largely the grasslands of the south had two fates, those that were in arable landscapes like that on the left, where the, shown here with the Virgin Prairie near Fort Smith, Arkansas. And then we have, for those, they were mostly converted to the cotton fields and corn fields and soybean that we see today. Um, many grasslands in less fertile soils, however, that were mostly savannas, with fire suppression commencing in the early 1800s, those then eventually grew into close canopy forest. So these are essentially what has become of the grasslands of the South. And today, they're largely unrecognizable landscapes. And unfortunately, they were never, uh, most of them were gone before the camera was invented. Most were never photographed or described. And therefore, we have very little knowledge of those original grasslands. And so why should we care about them? This is a photograph that shows the last of its kind, a remnant wet prairie near Chapel Hill, North Carolina. And, and these grasslands are exceptionally important. One, there's an untold story. They're extremely important to our history as a nation and to the history of Native Americans because these grasslands served as um, uh, for hunting grounds and so many other purposes. The species that make those up were vitally important. And so that's a story. Many of our early trade routes owe their uh, connection to grasslands. Our agricultural landscapes owe their connection with fertility to grasslands. Obviously, there's economic uh, benefits, wildlife watching, the horticultural trade, uh, a multi-billion dollar outdoor recreation economy with hunting. Services such as carbon sequestration and pollination. And then also I think you know, we can't forget just uh, biodiversity, which is huge. And so what we're seeing is that nowadays with the, the loss of grasslands that has transpired over the past two centuries, we've seen the collapse of bison and greater prairie chickens from the east due to various factors. Um, but also then we're now beginning to see all these unsung heroes like grasshopper sparrows and uh, meadow jumping mice beginning to disappear. And so with the disappearance of so many uh, plant and animal species, now the conservation community really is beginning to stand up and take notice due to things like bobwhite quail, which um, right now uh, a recent Partners in Flight report suggests that the current quail population will cut in half by the year 2029 and that it will cut in half again by the year 2036. So, you know, could we be looking at the functional extinction of a species that was once so common just in the next few decades? So we asked the question, can our grasslands survive into the next century? Well, we believe that right now there's a lot of focus in the East on forest conservation. There's a lot of money that goes to that, both philanthropically and from corporate sponsorship. There's a bunch of money that goes into wetlands, a lot of money that goes into um, aquatic resources and climate change. Very little money is being directed toward our naturally open landscapes. And we believe that the loss of these open landscapes is directly responsible for the loss of so many plant and animal groups that we see and is leading to widespread ecological collapse. We believe that this is the greatest threat facing the terrestrial biodiversity of eastern North America now. And that's why we believe that we need to have a, a change and, and chart a new course for conservation until it's too late. So we have designed and, and developed the Southeastern Grasslands Initiative over the past two years um, to cover a 23 state region spanning from approximately uh, Philadelphia to Joplin, Missouri, south to Miami and Corpus Christi. And the challenges facing grasslands are hugely complex. We still have large gaps in our knowledge. There are many types that are functionally extinct that have gone from a half million acres down to literally five acres. Let that sink in for a second. Uh, there's a scarcity of funding, there are diminished resources, lack of fire crews, and nowadays many colleges and universities are no longer teaching natural history, so there's also declining expertise. In a recent mapping effort uh, led by World Wildlife Federation, um, the grasslands of the south weren't mapped um, in contrast to those of more western and, and central regions of the United States. So there has been essentially no focus uh, on many of the grassland systems of the southeast. What we want to do with SGI 
is to provide leadership to be a resource center, both with a physical resource base and also a major online presence. So we've developed a website and we are pursuing talks with NatureServe to begin to develop a, um, an interactive online uh, portal. Uh, education and outreach. We had a talk about citizen science earlier. That's going to be a major focus of ours going forward. Uh, advocacy and policy is critical, but we also want to develop into a granting program using uh, philanthropic uh, dollars to begin to help our partners in conservation across the South. Just recently, um, just the past couple months, we've been funded by NRCS to hire our first coordinator who will work across Central Tennessee and Kentucky to help restore um, about 7,000 acres of grasslands uh, in areas that were historically grasslands. And that's a jointly supported position with our partners of Quill Forever. Again, we think that uh, there are already well-established models in the Chicago area um, with the Chicago wilderness and some of the forest preserves up there that we're looking to that are tried and uh, tested and proven successful techniques and using volunteers to restore and recreate grasslands on scales ranging from less than an acre to 3,500 acres. And this is uh, really resulting in some key benefits to wildlife. Henslow sparrows on the rebound in the Chicago area. Federally listed butterflies are coming back and finding these grasslands. And I'm not talking about just planting warm season grasses. We're talking about the restoration using hundreds of native species in a given mix, sometimes between 200 and 450 species of local genotype material to recreate some of these landscapes. Obviously, though, we are focused on other initiatives as well, making sure that certain areas are of existing native grasslands are protected or ma maintained or managed. Right now, across the South, in places like the Washita Mountains, um, the Cumberland Plateau of Tennessee, the Piedmont of Carolinas, we have a lot of forested landscapes that, based on historical data, used to be open pine or oak savannas. We have the, the potential right now um, to restore tens of thousands of acres of open savanna habitat if we can overcome the public hurdle. There would be major public backlash because of the misunderstanding that forests are good. And forests are not always good in all settings, and we need to realize that. We have been funded by um, philanthropists with the Ban Foundation, so we have received a quarter million dollars in funding. Uh, we are about to um, uh, receive a multi-year grant from them in the form of a challenge grant. We've also received some funding from the National Science Foundation for projects that are sort of tangentially related to this. And we've worked with a number of federal and state agencies, and recently been contacted also by the Seminole Nation out of Oklahoma. So please visit our website at www.segrasslands.org and make sure that you watch our video. We have a, a really nice mini documentary there. And um, you can sign up to, to, uh, to become a member of SGI. You can get our newsletter. And also there's a place on there if you want to sign up to be a volunteer. This takes all of our efforts, folks. Please understand that grasslands have to become the priority in Eastern North America going forward. Thank you. Again, excellent timing. Thank you so much, Dwayne. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next presenter is Kenneth Meyer of the Avian Research and Conservation Institute, who will be discussing snail kites. Ken? Thanks, Elena. I am the uh, director of the nonprofit Avian Research and Conservation Institute. We're based in Gainesville, Florida. I'd like to acknowledge my co author, Gina Kent. We became a non-federal partner in the South Florida Caribbean CESU over a year ago, uh, so I'm very happy to be involved and to be here. I'll probably use all my time, but if you post your questions or comments, I'll, be, I'll respond to you by tomorrow, and uh, my contact information is on the last slide. In the next few minutes, I'm going to summarize our research on the endangered snail kite in Florida, which we began over 11 years ago. Uh, then I'm going to introduce a study that we recently started on the kite's principal prey, the apple snail. This is supported by the Army Corps of Engineers through the uh, CESU. Uh, this is a continuation of Phil Darby's work from the University of West Florida. This new apple snail research, I think, integrates well with our long-term studies of snail kites, uh, which run mainly on non-governmental funds. Uh, it seems like this could be an excellent element in the, the sort of coordinated, collaborative vision that we heard a lot about this morning. In the case of the federally endangered snow cut, of course, uh, it's the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has uh, the, the direct oversight and, and the influence over the shape of the research effort. 
so that's the context. Let's get on with the biology. This is the distribution of the snail kite globally and in Florida. As you can see, it is mainly a, a tropical and subtropical species. And in the state of Florida, that, uh, that brown range that you see, that is it, bounded on three sides by water and on the north by unsuitable habitat. So uh, it's, it, the deck is sort of stacked against it uh, in terms of population stability or maintaining at least a sustainable population. So this is what some people refer to as a nomadic species. That's not to say they don't show fidelity to particular sites at certain times of year, but they do have the capacity to move around the landscape quite a bit. And so back in 2006, we were asked if we would uh, get involved in, in doing some telemetry, different kinds of technology, including satellite, combination of satellite and VHF, uh, because it hadn't been done for a long time. And a couple of national panels had, uh, were critical of the progress on recovery of the snail cat. I should say this bird has been listed for 51 years, uh, federally listed as endangered. This trap that we developed uses live snails. You can see it in the upper left, a series of nooses over the top of, of snails down in a mesh. And the reason this was important is that prior trapping was done with a ballistic net gun, and it had been causing some uh, injuries and mortalities. So we did have the methodology. We'd done a lot of this sort of thing before. And uh, we were pleased to take on the challenge and to move on. But underlying all this, the snow kite actually has extremely low nest success. And that's the percent of young that fledge from the nest. Um, on average, it's less than 40%. And if you look at this compared to other raptors in Florida, it's considerably lower. And actually, that's true for um, all four species of kites that occur in the United States. They all have low nest success. This is a primitive. These are all primitive raptors. They're social. They're lightly built. Uh, they eat a wide variety of very small prey. And it probably puts them at risk. There's a lot of extreme population swings for all of these species of kites. So the telemetry, this is where we focus. The green circles toward the north are represent 10 kites that we tagged with traditional, uh, old-fashioned, I guess, basic satellite telemetry, no GPS capability. So coarse accuracy, but very, very valuable compared to anything we've done before. For this particular study that I'm going to describe, we tagged 12 kites with GPS-enabled satellite transmitters, collecting highly, highly accurate locations and uploading them to satellites periodically. So those are the birds that you see marked in red. This is an example from one bird over a period of three years. Uh, you can see core areas uh, that represent, probably represent nesting, although we weren't doing the groundwork. Um, this study was being done simultaneously with a long running uh, challenge, a very challenging project conducted by the University of Florida to monitor and uh, identify management recommendations for snail kites. But you can get the idea. This bird, this single bird in three years, was uh, covered its pretty much the whole range of the species. So when I say the US distribution of snail kites, remember that is the southern half of the Florida Peninsula. So as you can see here, when we look at all the birds, all 12 birds, each a different color, they actually, uh, there's some places that are important, much more important than others. And we were curious about how that compares with where the birds are being counted and uh, where they're actually going. And what we discovered was most of them do not spend much of their time, all of them actually spend relatively little time on Waxahachie National Wildlife Refuge, for instance, the picture in the upper right, the left side of that picture. So these fixes indicate uh, some of the habitats. They don't look like the historic natural wetlands that we associate with snail kites. Another example of that in the highly urbanized area uh, around the high acres. Two maps on the left, those are single birds, the orange dots collected, connected by lines. That's over the course of a year for each of those birds. A picture on the right, that's four adults for 18 months, each one a different color over the course of a little more than a year, year and a half. So you, you get the idea. This is an, uh, an animal that is built, that is adapted, highly adapted, to seek out the resources it needs, the food that it needs, snails. That is their prey. They don't really take many other things, the occasional crayfish. So this bird is highly adapted to find refugia, places that have remnant snail populations in extremely dry conditions. And just to accommodate this cycle we have in Florida of uh, where wet cycles are, are not necessarily directly related to seasons of the year. 
and a large part of that is an effect of how we've altered the environment. So you can see they move long distances, they have specific core areas, and we're in a process of looking more closely at those. But, but note this number, 83% during this breeding season, 83% of those fixes are outside those red hatched areas that are the managed and monitored areas, the places where we focus on saving snail kites. So we thought that this particular result was, was kind of illuminating. Another result we got, we looked at total mercury, starting at the north in yellow, the lowest concentrations, uh, increasing to the south, as we might expect from what we know about mercury. But this is total mercury. This is not methyl mercury. So of course, the question for those black and blue fit, uh, locations down in the Everglades, uh, the question, of course, is how high is the methyl mercury? And, and that will indicate whether or not we should expect sublethal effects. Uh, these are insidious. This can impair reproduction without the birds showing, the adults showing any external signs. Uh, one of the biggest effects is uh, embryo mortality. So it happens in the egg stage. It looks just like a failed nest or an abandoned nest. So that's, that's pretty tricky. But just to give you an idea, the, the total mercury that we got roughly equals what's been found in other species, one being the Carolina wren. Uh, the, to, the same total mercury levels would cause a reduction of 30, 40 to 40 percent in nest success. So we really have to get at that methyl mercury question. That's more expensive. And we're looking to private donors uh, as a nonprofit. That's something we can, we can do, not always successfully, uh, to support that effort. The snails, this is a new project. So it's right here at the end. Uh, this is a project uh, that a uh, gentleman from the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, Al Confresco, uh, said uh, was one of the projects that the Corps is supporting, and it's, it's coming through the CES year. So one of the problems, as you all know, of course, or, or interesting considerations is that we have exotic apple snails. Um, on the left, the native snail. On the right, the exotic. And uh, no, the exotic has not uh, greatly reduced, apparently, the native populations, nor has it excluded it, which is surprising, because <coughs> the uh, those are the eggs of the exotic species uh, at the bottom of that stalk, native on the top. The eggs of the exotics are much more tolerant to a wide range of uh, wet conditions, from, from submersion to desiccation. Uh, so they're very prolific. They live longer than the native snails. They grow faster. Uh, so you would think, uh, in a lot of cases, this would be a problem for the snail kites. So far, it looks to be an advantage. But this might help explain why we see the snail kites moving into all these urban and suburban areas where they're living on, apparently, what they're finding in canals, retention ponds, agricultural areas, ditches, uh, that sort of thing. So we have to wonder about what the toxic effects of that might be. Where do we go from here? Well, we can pose these questions. Is, is Everglades restoration going to support snail kite recovery in the long run? And will these alternative habitats, these peripheral or non-natural habitats, will they be safe in the long run? And will they be productive for snail kites? Or is there some combination of natural and unnatural that will help this bird uh, persist? And then, of course, as the satellite data indicate, maybe we should be looking a little more closely at uh, whether the monitoring and management efforts are being appropriately focused spatially. And uh, thanks to all these people, and of course, thanks to you. Ken, thank you so much. Um, just uh, to let the audience know that if you have questions, you can post them in the chat. And again, the timing was excellent. Um, moving on, as we are encroaching into our uh, break session, uh, Ricky White will be from NatureServe will be discussing longleaf pine. Ricky? Hi, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Excellent. Uh, yeah, so uh, again, my name is Ricky White. I work with NatureServe, uh, and I'm also working uh, closely with the Florida Natural Areas Inventory, which is uh, under the purview of Florida State University, which is a CESU partner. So I thought we'd talk a little bit about uh, some of the open pond work that um, we have been uh, working on over the past uh, decade or two. And then if there's any time for questions, we'll, we'll try to get through that, too. So uh, just real quick, uh, uh, and uh, just wanted to, for, for folks who don't know who NatureServe is, uh, we're basically the, the folks who provide the data and the tools to support efficient conservation action. We're a non-governmental organization, but we're also a uh, membership network. So we work with uh, 83 or 86 network programs across this hemisphere, including 
uh, natural heritage programs in every state. Uh, and if you want to boil it down, uh, we uh, essentially answer, try to answer five key questions. So around species and ecosystems, we're asking uh, what is it, where is it found, how is it doing, and uh, what are the actions that will help and are those actions working? Uh, so we collect data uh, through a lot of our program partners and other uh, affiliates. Uh, we transform that data into products, and that, in essence, provides some, some meaning and context to help guide decision making. Uh, today I want to talk to you about one of the uh, ecosystems that we work in. Um, you know, we work in both, we're interested in rare plants and animals as well as ecosystems. Uh, the Lonely Pine ecosystem is one of the more in, endangered ecosystems uh, in the country, if not the globe. Only 5% of those original lonely pine woodlands remain. And uh, uh, Dwayne will tell you that, um, uh, Dwayne Estes will tell you that they, that ranges from forest to woodland to savanna. So we would consider those uh, in, in many classifications grasslands or savannas. Uh, there's a, a ton of unique species that exist only in those ecosystems. And in the southeast, especially in the coastal plain, uh, we've seen over the last 500 years a lot of change uh, caused by humans, including the rise and fall of agriculture and the rise of a lot of uh, newer development. Uh, I'm going to take us through some examples of uh, what, what we're interested in doing and what we've been working on. We're interested in, in answering the question of uh, how much high-quality longleaf or open pine habitat is out there. And uh, more importantly, what we're focusing on is how you define what high-quality is. So uh, we've been working with the Forest Service, uh, Florida, Florida Natural Areas Inventory, and other uh, collaborators to develop kind of desired forest condition metrics for, for a while now. Uh, more recently, we have been partnering with uh, Fish and Wildlife Service uh, and the Gulf Coastal Plains and Ozarks LCC and other landscape conservation cooperatives to, to really help address some needs that America's Longleaf has in terms of better understanding the acreage of high-quality longleaf that's out there across the range. NatureServe is basing a lot of our work on some previous work we did uh, for the EPA where we developed a whole uh, methodology for what we call ecological integrity assessment. Um, I'm going to call that rapid assessment to make it easier going forward, but that's an interchangeable term to me. Uh, for ecological integrity assessment, um, the work that we're doing with Longleaf, we're looking at mostly level one and level two ecological integrity assessment. So that means uh, level one being using remotely sensed data, so that's the least uh, resource intensive of the methodologies. Uh, but we're also looking at taking rapid ground-based data, which we consider level two. We're not going to talk about level three today because that's more um, very specific plot-based data that is uh, uh, out of scope of the work we're doing. That's, that takes too much effort, and we're really looking at gearing this work towards uh, maximizing the number of people that collect, can collect data and minimizes the, minimizing the resources needed to collect data. For the metrics, we really developed them with an eye towards uh, making sure we were addressing metrics that, um, that could help us understand the quality of habitat for priority wildlife, uh, overall ecological condition and, and integrity, and um, thinking of, about incorporating the size and landscape context, context metrics to help us better understand what the overall conservation value of some of these areas are. Uh, we didn't start from scratch, uh, so we used as many of the existing uh, uh, initiatives uh, as we could out there to that, that define condition. Uh, and so that ranged from previous work that the Forest Service did all the way to some uh, work that America's Longleaf has worked on. Uh, on ecological condition of lonely pine ecosystem. There's also a ton of literature out there that we harvested first off uh, related to rare species within those habitats and the needs that those rare species have. Uh, we developed um, some initial metrics based on that literature review and some expert knowledge as well as some uh, initial uh, field work. Then we worked with uh, experts and engaged them in workshops to refine those metrics further. Uh, this, slide's gonna, uh, this slide has uh, uh, violated all PowerPoint rules, so I, I apologize, but basically what I'm trying to, to show here is that we developed a version 1.0 report, and that very small fine, fine document on the right is our one-page data sheet. 
And what that essentially allows folks to do is with a, a relatively small amount of botanical knowledge and a, at a relatively short period of time, you can go out and, and take data uh, on the ground to look at uh, a, a quick, get a quick idea of the quality of uh, longleaf habitat that you're looking at. Uh, we split that up. If you if you take that data sheet and look at it a little more close up, um, you'll see that we split it up into a few categories. We want to assess for, for longleaf for interest in the canopy. Uh, so we take data on the basal area, the canopy cover, uh, stand age structure, and hardwood basal area. Uh, for, but we're also interested in the mid-story because the mid-story tells us a lot about the health of the forest and the habitat that it provides, especially the, the cover of, of short and tall shrubs. And one of the things that gets ignored in a lot of the longleaf work to date has been the ground layer metrics. Um, the ground layer is extremely important in terms of maintaining uh, species diversity of plants. And that species diversity drives a lot of the, uh, the biodiversity in that ecosystem. So, you know, not all, um, it, 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 it's different to have a, a uh, ground layer that's 100% one species versus, uh, for instance, you know, 50 or 100 species. Uh, we didn't want folks to go out and take um, specific inventories because that would have taken too long and taken uh, uh, experts uh, in botany. So we tried to kind of create metrics that are more general. So looking at native warm season grass cover, lonely pine regeneration, and overall native herbaceous ground cover to try to kind of get at some of that diversity without having to, to, to identify every single species. We also, again, brought in these landscape metrics. Uh, this is just an example of taking national land cover data and uh, using it to look at some of our study sites and helping us understand what the context is for those sites. So those scores are a score from 0 to 10. Uh, closer to 10 you are, the better that site is in terms of it being buffered um, from uh, land uses that aren't ideal for the kind of habitat we're interested in. So in this case, paved roads um, makes, uh, draw, drives down the score, natural areas drives up the score. You pull it all together and you can create uh, some really cool products, including a web-based um, spreadsheet that we're working on right now, uh, where folks can potentially go onto their handheld um, device or onto a, a computer and enter in the field data in real time and automatically get some kind of um, scores for both uh, the, the canopy mid-story ground and an overall score. So uh, that's, um, that's about all I've got for, for this project. What we're interested in doing next is um, primarily we've, we're looking at version 1.0, but we're not confident that those metrics are exactly right yet. So we're looking at testing out, continuing to test out those metrics using existing data or new data, especially some data that, that's already um, in process of being collected in throughout the southeast in uh, national forest lands and some other sites. If you if you have data that you think might be useful to this, feel free to reach out and contact me after after the call. We're also looking at applying this ecological integrity assessment approach for other ecosystem types in the southeast. We're developing them for all the ecosystem types in Arkansas and would be interested in expanding that to other states. And finally, um, I'm really interested in particular in trying to develop a more cohesive um, set of coefficients of conservatism for the southeast. Um, not going to have time to go into what that means. Uh, the other term for is floristic quality. So if you're really curious about that, you can reach out to me after the call as well. Thank Thanks. You. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Ricky, for the presentation. Um, enjoyed it. Um, and again, um, in the interest of time, if you have questions, please add it to the chat box or send it via email. And uh, I know we have started to move into the next se session. Um, before we move on, I wanted to thank all the speakers from the oral session uh, for your presentations and time. I'd like to thank Keith for moderating. And also, Kelly, thank you so much for the logistics. At this point, Kelly, I'll, I'll hand it over to you to get us to the next section. Kelly or Giselle, are you there? Hello, this is Giselle. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Giselle. Would you like to um, go ahead with the rapid fire? Start now, given the time. Yes, 
Yes, I'm ready. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Giselle. So um, we will be switching into the last session of this virtual conference. If you have been hanging on with us, you deserve a special brownie points and an endurance medal. And um, this is Kelly, I us? just wanted to remind you that I had to load up the final rapid session uh, slides. That's done now during that period. I'm unable to speak, but you are ready to go. OK, thank you. So I was just saying that if you um, have been with us, thank you for um, your uh, sustained support. If you just tune in, you join the Southeast TSU virtual conference. Uh, the conference theme is collaboration and cooperation in protecting resources and ecosystems. My name is Jason Mora. I'm the Gulf Coast CSU coordinator for the National Forest Service. And this session features three minute rapid presentations, which are the equivalent of your poster sessions if you were on a traditional conference. We the presentations are three minutes. If you have any questions, and I do encourage you to submit questions in the chat um, box, which is on the lower left corner of your screen. If we do not have a chance to get into those questions, we will uh, send them to the presenters, and you will get um, an answer. So with that further ado, I would like to introduce Todd Lockingdose from uh, the University of Richmond. Todd? Great. Thanks, Giselle. Um, it's great to reconnect with you over these wires. Give a holler if you can't hear me. I'm assuming you can. It's my pleasure yes, to kick off the rapid fire presentations. Um, so I asked the question, how can, we how can we get the public more engaged in our national parks? As part of its centennial celebration, the national parks were encouraged to participate in activities of biodiversity discovery. Many parks chose to engage the public in this work through BioBlitz inventories. And as many of you know, the goal of a BioBlitz event is to discover and document as many species as possible within a park during a 24-hour period. It's a wonderful opportunity for citizen science. And as part of the centennial, over 40 parks invited thousands of volunteers to participate in BioBlitzes. How did we do it at, um, what did we do at Richmond National Battlefield that was a little bit different? We started off with the traditional BioBlitz approach. The Totopotomy Creek unit where we conducted the survey is a recent addition to the park. And because relatively little was known about the biodiversity of the site, it seemed the perfect location for BioBlitz. During the 24-hour event, over 100 citizen scientists surveyed the park's floor and fauna. And these participants included school children, park staff, local naturalists and volunteers, faculty and students from four local universities, a private liberal arts institution, the second largest public university in Virginia, a historically black college, and a local community college. In total, nearly 1,000 observations were recorded, and these were logged into I, the iNaturalist app, where our next community of users picked up the ball. In this virtual online global community, they did the work of verifying the species identity from what was entered as the best guess ID in the field. And in some cases, they truly were guesses. In total, 386 unique species were confirmed, cataloged, and coded by taxonomic group. So now we've taken this local community of observers and lifted their data to the cloud, where whole different groups of, group of individuals were able to interact with the park, in essence, doubling the, the contact network from the event. And where do we go from here? Halfway across the country, an artist colleague in Chicago was tracking the data and thinking about novel ways of displaying the information. Some of the images uploaded to iNaturalist resembled the plastic toys that she had lying around her house. And she realized there was an opportunity to link the remarkable natural diversity found in an urban suburban park to the diversity of unwanted toys cluttering people's homes. She engaged a third community, parents in her local school system, in collecting plastic toys to represent the biodiversity of the park. Like the original BioBlitz data collection, the toy collection effort was locally crowdsourced. So a cat bird observed in the field became an angry bird toy. Other connections were a little bit more abstract. Toys were eventually color coded and arranged in taxonomic groups to reflect the BioBlitz findings as an eight foot tall pie chart that was installed in the Harnett Art Museum back here in Richmond. To further the project goals of education about biodiversity, conservation, and responsible stewardship, an iPad located next to the pie chart wall 
installation contain information explicitly linking the toy collection with the biodiversity data. And so that was our project in a nutshell, linking together online and two local communities. Thank you for the opportunity to share the story. Thank you, Todd. Our next presenter is Larissa Montes from the University of Miami. Hello to everyone. My name is Larissa Montes, and uh, I am a PhD student at the University of Miami under Dr. Helena Solovay-Gwin. Given the time constraints, I'll speak to you for about four minutes, and I will answer any questions you may have via email. I'm reading on the chat window, but you can't listen to me. Larissa, if you're if you're using the com you may want to mute your computer. Can you listen to me? Yeah, there is some background noise, Mar Narita, but I would encourage you to continue because the time Okay, I'm using the setup that I've used for the test, and that was fine. So, I am now placing my contact information in the chat window, as well as the project website. I am very excited to be a member of the multidisciplinary team working on the beach exposure and child health study beaches. The project will integrate oceanographic data to forecast health risks from oil fuel compounds. Following the April 20th, 2010 Deep Water Horizon accident, British Petroleum and the governmental agencies working to respond to the accident engaged in one of the largest environmental data gathering efforts in history. Many lessons have been learned from the Deep Water Horizon emergency and scientific response. The continued surfacing of discoveries justifies increasing the engagement of the scientific community with the emergency response community with the aim to better guide the decision making process in future events. Looking back on the week after the explosion, there was considerable uncertainty regarding the risks associated with the oil spill. The uncertainty concerning health risks were driven by the lack of knowledge about precise exposure, especially for children who are more vulnerable. Uncertainty also existed for the spread of all steel chemicals in beach, sand, water, and air. This resulted in negative impacts to Gulf Coast industry, lots of opportunity for public use of coastal areas, with subsequent damages to the economy. Through this project, we aim to address the uncertainty and general health risks resulting from exposure to oil field chemicals during recreational beaches. Specifically, the goal of beaches is to gain knowledge towards quantifying exposures and risks from oil field chemicals in child beach play. Beaches will accomplish this goal by quantifying children's thermal, ingestion, and inhalation related beach play and time spent activities while accounting for beach physical factors. These contributions will be used to create an exposure modeling and estimation platform that can guide beach closures in light of health risks to promote safe beach usage for the most susceptible populations. The guiding hypotheses of this project are that health risks are driven by safety patterns and oil food chemical concentrations. Both of these are interesting. Marisa, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I'm asking you to please wrap up in a few seconds that you have ahead. Okay, so um, I have just completed a very brief presentation on how this project aims to gain knowledge for quantifying exposures and risks from oil field chemicals in child age play. Uh, the project is in the initial stages. We started work this past January, but we are very excited about the discoveries we have made so far. Thank you very much for listening to my presentation. I will now place again the contact details on the chat window, and please reach out to me if you'd like to learn more about the project or for any questions you may have. Thank you. 
Thank you, Larissa. And I just want to let you know that she uh, posted um, a web link in the chat room if you're interested in hearing more about it. Thank you. Our next presenter is Jennifer Franklin. Hello. Thank you for this opportunity to uh, present this project. But I can work. Jennifer, before you begin, can you please all check your phone and make sure everybody's on mute? Oh, you did. Thank you. Okay. Uh, go ahead, Jennifer. Okay, thank you. Um, so this is a technical assistance project that was through the Mid-Atlantic CESU. And I want to acknowledge the National Park Service for funding for this project. And it's just wrapping up in the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal National Historic Park. So this is park is, um, was initially, the project was initiated by safety concerns. And you can see in the photo on the left, you have people, uh, tourist groups setting up lawn chairs underneath a dead tree. Um, but it, it turned into a little bit more than than a simple assessment. And so the park is actually 195 miles long. Um, it's primarily an early succession of riparian forest. It was established in the decade after the canal closed in 1924. So it's an even age. And normal successional processes are proceeding. So we have a lot of you know, dieback of the early successional species. But it's occurring along with some heavy public use that is in many cases, preventing the establishment um, of the next successional stage in the forest. And you can see there's some fairly heavy degradation of the riparian zone in that center photo. So we um, brought, were brought in to provide technical assistance to assess the current conditions and develop a restoration plan that could be used across the 60 campsites, picnic areas, and visitor centers and to make recommendations that could be incorporated into a new vegetation management plan that the park is developing. So we collected data on tree dieback uh, by species and diameter, and also mortality, and also data on factors that might be limiting forest regeneration, including things like soil compaction and soil chemistry that are altered by human use. This data can be used for future research and assessments of the restoration success. We were also able to recommend changes to some of the management regimes, and particularly mowing, um, that can reduce their ongoing maintenance costs while improving the ecological function and better meeting some of the con conservation goals of the park. So in addition to providing some baseline data for research, the project also provided training for a master's student in restoration planning. So for future projects, to say this one is just wrapping up, I'm very interested in assessment of restoration success. So I'm hoping to go back to this and some other sites. Um, and my email address is at the bottom there. And I'm just pasted into the chat window the uh, lab URL. Excellent, Jennifer. Thank you so very much. Um, our next presenter is Justin Shed from NC State. Justin? Uh, yes, good afternoon. Can we hear me? Or can people hear me? Yes, we can hear you very well. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Uh, name is, my name is Justin Shedd. I'm with uh, North Carolina State University Central for Geospatial Analytics. Uh, my contact information is in the upper right-hand corner in the yellow box. Uh, recently awarded a National Park Service Inventorying and Monitoring Scientific Management Partner Award for 2017. This project, Integrating Science into National Park Service Resource Management via WebGIS, addressed common impediments that impact a resource manager's ability to make timely and informed decisions. Impediments such as gaps in communication and a lack of easy access to geospatial data and information generated by the diverse programs within the National Park Service. To find a solution, uh, the Mid-Atlantic Network of the uh, Inventory Monitoring Program partnered with North Carolina State University to develop a single platform where resource managers and support staff can access baseline information on natural resource inventorying and monitoring locations as well as management actions uh, by exotic plant management teams and the wildland fire program occurring on National Park Service lands. 
uh, Mid Atlantic Network articulated a project uh, goals from the beginning uh, that uh, desktop and the, the, the deliverable was to be in desktop and mobile environments. It was to be sustainable and it was not to be another system that required extensive training. Uh, the guiding principle was to enhance communication between regional staff, exotic pest uh, team, wildland fire team, and park resource managers uh, by providing the monitoring location and management actions taking place in the parks. Not only does this benefit the resource managers, but it promotes closer ties between the various programs that support park managers. Uh, in consultation with parks and regional programs, a series of park-specific web maps were developed that capitalized on existing workflows to create a single map interface displaying INM monitoring locations, exotic pest current and historic treatment uh, geospatial data, wildland fires treatment and wildfire data, and local data vital to park management activities. The web maps were developed in, or the web maps developed in the National Park Service's ArcGIS online organization, utilize existing National Park Service and external map services, as well as hosted services to facilitate the sharing of geospatial information. These web maps allow INN staff to see management actions taking place at the parks and allows the park management to not only see a complete picture of, his, of historical and current management actions, but enables them to collect data on local treatments in an efficient manner. Uh, so just to distill this even more, this project brought four different groups together, improved the communication between those groups, provided for workforce development, and enabled resource managers to make decisions with the best available data. Um, thank you. Again, my name is Justin Shedd. And uh, contact information is in the upper right hand corner. Thank you, Justin. And following on our GIS integration theme, the next presenter is Williams Lockham from UNC Wilmington. Hey everybody, this is Bill Slocum. I'm actually at NC State University, not UNC. Please don't get me mixed up with that crowd. Oh, sorry. It's, <laughs> that's, it's fine. Eight, it's, that's fine. That's it's, fine. It's, how many hours have we been on this? <laughs> We're one big happy university family here in North Carolina. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bill Slocum. I'm a research associate uh, here at NC State University and a lead faculty on our professional science master's program. Thanks for your time today and allowing me to present some of our applied research funded by the National Park Service. If time permits, I'll be happy to answer questions, but my email address is down there on the bottom and, and I'm, I'm always available through that. Today I would like to talk with you about purpose-driven spatial decision support systems to provide effective, efficient, and accurate data among stakeholders all delivered through the web. The solution and associated technology may be applied to any geographic location, and scale as well as situation. So on the left hand side here, you ha I have an example with the National Park Service. And what I did was develop a system to assist with Superstorm Sandy recover disaster recovery, rehabilitation, and funding allocation for 11 National Park Service units in the Northeast. The system is configured to allow field personnel, in this case, local personnel at Gateway National Recreation Area in New York City, they're on the lower left, to document damaged resources, spatial location, and assign descriptive attributes to those assets simply using a web browser with no, uh, no training whatsoever, as Justin mentioned with his activities. Once entered, these data are automatically saved to a multi-user, concurrent use, authoritative enterprise geospatial database. So it's a centralized database with multiple areas of, of, of access and connectivity. Once saved, those same data are available to decision makers in real time. So it's a real time transfer of data from field personnel to decision makers. It's important to note that in a lot of cases, decision makers are spread across the US. In this case, Denver, Colorado, Washington, DC, and other places around the New York City area. In addition, the decision makers, as you can see in the other uh, web application up there in the cloud, have access to NOAA floodplain data. So depending on the audience, we have different levels of data that they may need to have. So the entire system is based on um, damaged resource footprints, NOAA floodplain data, and other ancillary information that allows decision makers to prioritize the efficient use of available funding and associated resources. So in 30 seconds, to recap, 
These systems and solutions may be configured to allow access to an authoritative centralized database and other web accessible data simply through a web browser, mobile device, or computer desktop without the addition of extra uh, software being installed to create and share actionable data among stakeholders while maintaining differing levels of security and access based on need to ensure that all stakeholders arrive at a uniform decision. Thank you all. Thank you. Um, the next presenter is Phil Olson, and I was just checking, and it seems that he was not able to attend. However, we would like to um, just show his slide, and Kelly MacArthur, uh, who is the wizard woman behind the scenes, is going to be kind enough to read his abstract. This is Kelly McCarter, and I'm calling out one last time. Steele Olson, are you with us? If so, please speak up. OK. I would like to read everyone this abstract associated with the research. The name of the research, Geospatial and Unmanned Aerial System UAS Applications to Environmental Research. Government agencies are increasingly seeking services to provide drone imagery and geospatial analysis data products. Urban development and land use planning, environmental hazards such as floods, fires, and other catastrophic events, coupled with the population and infrastructure vulnerability and conservation mapping and management are just a few examples. The University of North Carolina Wilmington has recently established a geospatial and drone analysis service group to provide very high resolution visual and multispectral imagery and geospatial data analytics. Our mission is to provide value-added imagery and geospatial products that solve a problem or address a need. We have researched and designed workflows for capturing and photogrammically processing several types of unmanned aerial systems, UAS, data sets resulting in high-resolution imagery that outperform satellite imagery and can be flown on demand. Secondly, we have used publicly available data to develop spatial analytics and statistical models for quantifying trends, patterns, and predicting distributions. Some examples include, one, spatial statistics that computes the relationship between independent variables and the death rate to Parkinson's disease in the United States, which each location has a unique prediction equation. Two, a model of population vulnerability to flooding for the coastal United States. Three, a statistical model of population vulnerability at the building scale using LIDAR data. Four, vegetation change through time to identify the rate of transitions from one type, for example, freshwater wetland, to another, for example, salt marsh. These workflows are tailored to provide specific products that can assist in monitoring and decision making within a variety of sectors that manage and conserve natural and cultural resources. This presentation will describe the purpose of UNCW Geospatial and Drone and Analysis Service Group and give specific examples of the work that has been accomplished. We train undergraduate and graduate students in geospatial technologies and imagery processing using applied research, and our goal is to build our program by developing new collaborations. Applied research is a focal point of UNCW, and any opportunities we develop will be used to further the mission of the university by funding students and garnering research resources. Thank you, Kelly. Our next presenter, sorry, our next presenter is Michelle Clendenin from the USDA Soil Management Division. Michelle? We cannot hear you, Michelle. You need to push the talk button on the top left corner in your screen. Can you hear me? Yes, now we can hear you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to um, uh, present today. I know there's a limitation, and so what I would do is 
briefly explain what ecological site descriptions are and how they are utilized. And then if there's time, um, questions and answers. The Soil Science Division of the U.S. Department of Agriculture is implementing an ambitious program to develop ecological site descriptions. And recent initiatives have expanded these in to the eastern United States to include all terrestrial and wetland land types as well as subaqueous surveys. This endeavor seeks to classify soils and vegetation with land units, land units which respond similarly to management and disturbance. An ecological site description incorporates abiotic and biotic environment factors such as climate, soil, and methyl, hydrology, vegetation, and natural disturbance regimes that together define the ecological site description. On the slide presented that you see, site concepts on the landscape depicted here represent a few might, one might encounter in the Carolina and Georgia Sandhills. The heart of the ecological site description is depicted in state and transition models, which are conceptual diagrams with accompanying narratives to illustrate ecological dynamics of the site using the states, community phases within states, pathways, or ecological processes between them. These models are developed using published literature, expert knowledge, field reconnaissance, inventory data, and otherwise known existing data sets. The goal of producing state and transition models is to provide a conceptual understanding of ecological dynamics that can change um, the drivers and mechanism, mechanism ecosystems and management actions that can influence them. In short, ecological site descriptions are tools that support inter interactions between land users, conservation planners, and the public. They contain information that can facilitate planning, evaluation, and implementation of conservation efforts. The success of all of this, however, depends on accessible, accurate, and relevant information to identify challenges and implement solutions. With the, up, up, with the continuing trend towards doing more with less, the USDA seeks opportunities to collaborate and develop partnerships in data sharing, the key being working with others to reduce duplication of efforts and facilitate combined landscape level conservation over large areas. Thank you. Questions? Thank you, Michelle. I am afraid uh, we um, you stop your time. So I encourage anybody who has questions for Michelle to type them up in the chat box. Our next presenter is Reynaldo Garcia from Florida International University. Reynaldo. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well. Go ahead. Thank you. Reynaldo, we could hear you well. You can go ahead. OK. Can you hear me now? Hello? Yes. OK. Yes. OK. So uh, I'm a collaborator of uh, Dr. Henry Briseño at uh, Florida International University. This research is aimed at uh, complementing an ongoing project led by Dr. Briseño, funded by National Park Service, that was uh, presented earlier uh, during this uh, afternoon session. Uh, the objective is to investigate the dynamics and conditions responsible for uh, elevated uh, total phosphorus levels in surface water discharges to the Everglades National Park. Um, Dr. Briseño Research is, found, is uh, building uh, an extensive data set using water velocity and pollutant concentration instrumentation. Uh, we are now applying a hyper-resolution hyper submeter cells numerical model to assess hydrology, detail hydrodynamics and dispersion of nutrients and related pollutants and integrate the model results with the hydrologic and water quality data gathered in the project. With the high resolution model, we anticipate getting a better understanding 
of the water and nutrient dynamics in the study area that includes water conservation area 3A and canals and marshes in the Everglades. We are currently focusing our modeling application in the area depicted in image one. Uh, this represents the L67A canal that flows into Tamayami Canal and bifurcates into the S333 gated structure to the right and the S12 day structure on the left through which water flows into the park. Data collected suggest a strong correlation between total phosphorus loadings coming from the park uh, or into the park uh, with hydrologic parameters. Uh, for instance, image two presents data from uh, two years indicating uh, that when water stages decrease below a certain level, uh, TP increases significantly and stage high during that period. Image three plots show that there is a clear stage threshold for situations where TP is below or above average. The same behavior has been observed in all study location. Now, image four depicts the numerical mesh used in the model that in this case has about one million triangular cells uh, and the model computes velocities, depth, and concentrations of, of different pollutants at each cell. Image uh, five shows uh, some numerical results we have uh, preliminary obtained that shows the distribution of phosphorus and also the velocity field and we plan on continuing extending the model application through the year. This is an ongoing effort to complement uh, the, uh, with numerical results, the, the data gather in the project. Thanks for attending my presentation and please feel free to email us uh, with any questions or comments you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Reynaldo. Our next presenter is Susan McGrath from East Carolina University. Susan, please take it on. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well. Move on. Great. Thank you. Um, so my research group has been studying the ecology and management of the King Rail, a coastal marsh system in North Carolina for the past seven years. Um, the King Rail populations have experienced alarming declines, and inland migratory populations have been hardest hit. Um, this is largely a function of wetland loss. Um, as you can see, king rails are pretty large uh, birds, and they're more carnivorous than other rails, and they require large tracts of pristine wetland for breeding, which mostly can only be found on the coasts. Um, king rails are an indicator species for wetland health, um, yet they're secretive by nature and very challenging to study. Um, you can see the marsh goes as far as the eye can see in this picture, um, but mostly we can't see our birds. Um, instead, we locate them by uh, their kick -kick calls, their mating calls. So um, Mackey Island National Wildlife Refuge and the surrounding area on the North Carolina-Virginia border is the main area that we uh, study this bird. Um, the refuge is aggressively managed with prescribed burns and um, invasive phragmites control. Each year we find and monitor 30 to 50 nests um, to determine the long-term trends in breeding activities. And I just want to highlight um, some of our, my students' findings. Up in the top right-hand corner, um, my student Jan Koltz um, determined that these, um, the breeders here were resident, and so he was able to follow them um, across uh, multiple seasons. And we determined the home range sizes shown here in these colored ranges. Um, we were able to document uh, seasonal habitat use, and uh, one of the main findings was that while breeding female, breeding males, sorry, um, tended to stay in the same areas between the breeding and the non-breeding season. The females were largely moving into a habitat type that we didn't expect at all, which was a wooded habitat type. Um, the results of um, these findings uh, led to some management changes to improve breeding success um, in this uh, species, including um, the, um, advancing the timing of um, impoundment drawdown and also um, the timing of prescribed burns. Um, our paper describing these findings as an ecology and evolution can be found on the link on your screen. Um, one of my other students, Amanda Clauser, down below, um, looked at ambient temperature versus the touch temperature by putting these um, thermocron eye buttons into model eggs and inserting them into nests. And as you can see from the uh, graph tracing there showing one example nest, um, parents are generally able to keep their incubation temperature constant um, in, in spite of incursions uh, from the ambient, but um, particularly we were curious to find out that the um, 
incubating birds were actually shading their eggs in times when the temperature exceeded the um, average uh, or the optimal um, incubation temperature. Um, our current studies are mostly looking at auditory um, results. So uh, my, my student, Katie um, Schrader, at the right-hand side is doing a lot of uh, monitoring um, using um, autonomous recording units, and we're now monitoring the populations and, and, and calibrating these mechanisms for um, detecting rails in other areas. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Athena Jones from the University of Miami. What was that? Okay, good. Hi, can you hear me? Back? Yes. Um, I think there's somebody else talking as well. Could everybody please look at their phones and make sure we're all in mute? I think then you can. Okay, um, I'll, I'll go on. So, my name is Athena Jones. I have too many microphones working. Um, I'm not sure how. If I'm sounding clear to everyone, I'll, okay, I'm good now. All right. So, anyways, my name is Athena Jones. I'm a PhD student at the University of Miami. I'm working on this project to study um, the effects of NALID in the environment and the concentrations of it with uh, PI Dr. Solo Gabriel, who you heard from before and you'll hear from uh, right after me on a different project. So the motivation to study the NALID in the environment is that it has unintended consequences when it's applied aerially to large um, swaths of land, such as the deaths of pollinators, um, so what we're looking into is the concentrations um, that can be found on the ground after an aerial application, and we're also doing lab work to determine the rate at which it degrades based on different uh, methods of exposure. Um, so to start with the field work, we've been working with local mosquito control authorities to determine when they're planning on um, spraying NALID through um, in the plane. And on the mornings when they do spray, we set up soils and water samples, and we also collect an air sample to get concentrations that hit the ground. And then um, we're looking into things that can affect its degradation into dichlorvos, which is another organophosphate pesticide, which is no longer aerially applied. So on the right-hand side, you can see some normalized concentrations that we found in the lab when exposing a sample of um, water spiked with NALID to UV. And the NALID degrades um, on the order of an hour. You can see it's in minutes on the top graph and in hours on the bottom. Um, in the order of an hour, most of the NALID that we spike in our samples has already been degraded and you see peak dichlorvos production around that same time. And when there's no UV exposure, um, we keep our samples in amber vials. The rate of degradation is a lot um, slower. And dichlorvos production is also um, less pronounced. So where we're planning to go with this next is to spike soil samples and sediment samples to determine whether or not there's an impact on the rate of degradation or the concentration that can be uh, retained by these samples and therefore possibly impact the environment. Um, and I think actually that's about it. If there's time for one question, I can take maybe one. Or what you can do is email me or submit the questions in the chat box. Um, but I appreciate your attention and thanks. Thank you, Athena. Um, I do not see any questions. All right. Thank you. Our next presenter is Helena Solo Gabriel from uh, the University of Miami. Hey. Helena, thank you. Um, I'm a professor at the University of Miami, and I will be presenting on work, a collaborative work, that was led by my student Nicole Johnson and myself at the University of Miami and colleagues at the University of South and Central Florida. 
The green sea turtle, scientific name Chelonia mitis, has been victim to increasing levels of a tumor forming disease, fibropapillomatosis, or FP. Tumors generally appear on soft skin tissues, such as flippers and neck, and in severe cases in which tumors have infected the eyes and mouth, individuals are debilitated by restricted eyesight, feeding, and swimming ability. The cause of FP is not known. However, associations have been found between FP and infection with the virus called Chelonese herpes virus 5. One interesting hypothesis has been proposed by Van Houten et al who found that tumor tissues positive for FP are associated with arginine, an amino acid. Arginine is a key component of outer viral envelopes and has a high concentration of nitrogen. Thus, the Van Houten et al. study suggests, although very controversial, that elevated nitrogen may, may be associated with FP. Specifically, the objective of the current study, consistent with the Van Houten arginine hypothesis, was to evaluate correlations between turtle strandings and water quality, especially nitrogen, and additional indicators of eutrophication, such as geographic indicators of human populations. Our methods involved evaluating for the 2011 to 2015 period of record, Chelonia minus stranding reports, and water quality data for the Florida Keys. The data were analyzed statistically and also spatially in ArcGIS. Results show that during the five-year period of study, a total of 660 turtle strandings, of which 423, or 64%, showed visible signs of FP. Of interest is that the number of strandings increased from 2011 to 2015, and even more significant is that the proportion of strandings showing evidence of FP also increased from 47% to 74% in 2015. We also observed FP-positive strandings in clusters near areas of high human population. In the Florida Keys, these clusters were observed within highly populated areas of Key West, shown in the blue circle, and the city of Marathon, shown in the green. When comparing human population density to FP-positive stranding normalized per kilometer, a strong positive linear correlation was observed between population density and the number of FP-positive strandings. Since the number of strandings may not be tied to the health of the overall population, we decided to conduct additional statistics using the proportions of strandings that were found to be positive for FP. Using the proportion of FP positive strandings, we found a positive correlation with nitrogen concentration. In conclusion, eutrophic areas and areas of high population density, such as those observed in the Florida Keys, should be evaluated to convert, confirm association between FP positive turtles and water quality. Again, we thank, I thank you for listening to my rapid fire presentation. Thank you, Helena. And our last but not least presenter is John Carroll from Georgia Southern University. John? Yes, thank you. Um, thanks for everybody who stuck around uh, to the end of the session. Um, so, like uh, his all just mentioned, my name is John Carroll, I'm a marine ecologist. Uh, who works at Georgia Southern University. Uh, and I'd like to tell you about my work uh, along the Georgia's coastal plain. Um, many of you are probably familiar with the coastal plain. In the southeast, it extends from the Piedmont region all the way down to the coast, uh, and it's considered a biodiversity hotspot. Contributing to the high biodiversity are the extensive oyster reefs, which, um, which line marsh creeks and help protect Georgia's 400,000 acres of marshes. In addition, oysters provide a number of other additional ecosystem services, uh, including habitat and food provision, um, improving water quality and clarity, nutrient sequ sequestration, among others. And so it's important to understand you know, the drivers of oyster populations in this region. With a collaborator from the geology department, Dr. Jackie Kelly, uh, I have been monitoring oyster populations in coastal Georgia, and we've done extensive surveys in uh, Oyster Creek, which is an oyster line marsh creek near Tybee Island. Uh, which is on the north uh, east coast of Georgia. So I want to just tell you a little bit about some interesting interactions that we've observed uh, with the oysters we've collected. We have 23 sites in the creek, uh, and we conduct quadrat surveys where we harvest oyster material from the lower, middle, and upper intertidal zones on the reefs. We return the oysters to the lab for processing where they're measured, photographed, weighed, and dissected. Um, during processing, 
Uh, we note the presence of the boring sponge, which is in the photo in the upper left uh, of your screen. Uh, it's a particularly devastating species which bores into calcareous substrates. It has caused problems all up and down the east coast of the United States for both oyster restoration, particularly in areas like North Carolina, and also problematic for oyster aquaculture. And in Georgia, it exhibits really high rates of bioerosion. Um, while we dissect the oysters, we also note the presence of pea crabs, which is that, that uh, photo in the upper right corner, um, which is an oyster parasite that lives in the mantle cavity of oysters and uh, in the process of living in the, the cavity of the oysters reduces the growth condition and reproductive output. Uh, both of these organisms cause negative effects on oysters and there appears to be some interaction between the species. Uh, oysters that have sponge, for example, are significantly more likely to also have the pea crab and this is about a three times more likely chance that they'll have the pea crab. And if we look at condition index, which is the lower right graph, uh, which is a good measure of oyster fatness, uh, we see that both species, when alone, have a negative effect on oysters, but when they're present together, the condition is farther reduced. Low condition can reduce an oyster's ability to put energy in reproductive output, as well as to reduce its ability to withstand uh, other stressors. So uh, we're currently using tissue samples from these oysters to explore whether population structure, that is relatedness, might play a role in susceptibility to these pests, and also whether other important parasites like MSX and Dermo are more prevalent in these stressed oysters. Uh, and thanks for watching. My uh, email didn't show up, so if Kelly, you could uh, send everybody my email if there's uh, any questions about what I've just talked to you guys about. Thank you. Thank you so very much, John. And with these, we conclude the Southeast CESU virtual conference. Um, as a reminder, the CESU stands for Cooperative Ecosystem Studies Unit. There are four of those in the Southeast region, and this is a form of partnership between federal agencies and public institution partners for the purpose of providing research, technical assistance, and education. During the day, the long day today, you had uh, the opportunity to sample the diversity of projects and the diversity of work that is accomplished through this partnership. And I would like now to turn in the microphone to Helena, who is going to do the formal wrap out. Um, I'd like to end the, the session today's uh, virtual seminar by thanking everyone on the line and also all of the speakers, the federal partners, oral and rapid fire presenters um, for uh, the time that you took and also for your flexibility. Um, we originally started this meeting as an in-person uh, meeting and now it was transitioned to a virtual meeting um, to accommodate um, uncertainties in, in budgets and budgets for, for travel. So I appreciate everyone's flexibility in um, accommodating the change in the meeting format. Um, and again, I'd like to emphasize that this was a coming together of five CESUs. Um, we had representation from each of these five CESUs in our planning committee. Um, our planning committee, again, I would like to thank, um, included Mary McCord, Kelly Belli, Gary Blank, Carol Daniels, Eric Davidson, Thomas Doyle, Danny Feiler, Michael Menjack, Giselle Mora, myself, Helena Solo Gabriel, and Kelly McCarter. So um, again, on behalf of um, all five uh, directors, I'd like to thank you. And uh, Keith, um, would you like to say additional thank you as well? Yes, thanks, Helena. I want to echo what you what you've already said and appreciating the efforts of all the the, the crew that put this together and, and the folks that that have spent all day uh, listening to this and participating whether they were just listening or, or giving your presentation but I don't want us to get out of here without thanking you Helena because without yeah. you I don't think this would have come off uh, we all worked on this but you were our leader and uh, if it wasn't for your determination this would not have happened so thank you Helena well, I'd like to also especially thank uh, Kelly um, for her persistence in pushing this through. Um, her efforts were incredible, and um, her coordination was wonderful, and the amount of time put into this was fantastic, and we're very, very grateful to NC State University uh, for hosting um, this meeting.
I think with that, uh, we are close, closing. Uh, Kelly, would you like to give any last um, closing statements in terms of um, where we can find PowerPoints and uh, recordings of the presentation? Yes, thank you very much. And I do appreciate all the kind comments uh, that all of you on the committee have made during this closing slide. Um, Dr. McCord and I um, truly believe in the CESU and the synergy that comes uh, from it principally, but also um, I have learned in the past 18 months just how dedicated the CESU representatives are throughout the United States and especially in the Southeast region. You have my applause and appreciation for everything you do. It's just very, very good. Uh, Marion, I, I don't know if you uh, would like to make a comment or even if you're in a position to activate a microphone just now. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, excellent. <laughs> um, I want to congratulate all of you um, for uh, taking a leap of faith to do this meeting um, and especially to Kelly for pushing it along and, and being so um, creative and, and accommodating. Um, one of the things that I hoped would come out of uh, this event was uh, better knowledge of what our peers are doing in the different uh, CESU units across uh, the Southeast and um, I was hoping that we could think of larger scale projects that were uh, presented this morning by um, Tom Fish um, and how we might uh, work together through our CESU units. Um, and how this event might be a springboard to or a catalyst for those types of collaborations. So uh, hopefully some of those larger scale efforts will be an outcome of this work. Thank you very much, Dr. McCord. Um, now I will just follow through with um, what was suggested to me by going to this final slide. This has been a broadcast using the Forestry and Natural Resources webinar portal, which is CESU funded, by the way, um, through the Southern Regional Extension Forestry Office and North Carolina State University Cooperative Extension Service and AgriLife Extension at Texas A&M University. Uh, we do provide um, webinar portal service like this at no charge um, on the subject of natural resources, climate change, restoration, uh, cultural resources, any number of the topics that have been uh, covered today are potential for hosting more in-depth, deep dive type one and two hour webinars. Um, and so I encourage any of you to visit www.forestrywebinars.net if you would like to make a presentation or bring together two or three researchers and reach this audience which today exceeded 200 people. So um, please keep that in mind. With that, I would say um, thank you. Feel free to log off. We are finished for today. And um, thanks, guys. You did it. Congratulations. Thanks, Kelly. Thank you. Hopefully. Hopefully.